Είναι πατημένο πάνω, γράφει. Οκ, so let us start. Uh, we, uh, we welcome you all in the first uh, uh, summer school organized by the three universities, Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, Financial University under the government of the Russian Federation, and the University of National and World Economy. Uh, this first summer school organized by the three universities under the title Sustainable Development in the Black Sea uh, is an initiative that is based upon the bilateral agreements existing between the three universities, the three institutions. Uh, given the specific circumstances of this period, and the fact that uh, it wouldn't be possible to host the first summer school in with physical presence of the students of the three universities uh, the decision of the organizing committee uh, which is appointed and uh, it is uh, being uh, hosting three six colleagues from the three institutions the decision of the organizing committee was to split the first summer school into a one-way webinar, one-day webinar on Monday, today, the 27th of July, consisting of three 90-minute courses uh, and uh, giving thereby one ECTS unit to the students that participate. Uh, the three 90-minute uh, courses, as you will see, uh, will be realized by uh, uh, our colleagues from uh, uh, Un University of World and National Economy, uh, namely uh, by Professor Ivan Bozinkin, uh, and also by Professor Alexander Ilinsky, initially from the Financial University uh, in Russia, uh, yet, uh, in place uh, of uh, Professor Ilinsky will be uh, Galenkimova, and we are very happy for that. And also, the third, uh, the third um, uh, course, the third uh, um, contribution, will be by Professor Nikos Nikolaos Theodosiu and myself uh, afterwards as the third contribution. Um, we we are really very happy for hosting this first one day set webinar today. We have more than uh, 55 participating students from the three universities. And this is a first phase of the first summer school. The second phase, the actual summer school will be realized next year in the days 17th to till 22nd of August. 2021, uh, and it will be hosted in the summer camp of Aristotle University of Thessaloniki in Kalkidiki uh, on the seaside area of Posidon. Uh, the camp is a fully organized establishment with reception, with information stand, restaurants, mini market, library, cinema, a beach bar, surely, uh, and open air areas and rooms for hosting the different sessions of the summer school. Uh, Wi-Fi possibilities as well as all other technical as well as health and safety facilities are inside the camp well organized and we uh, hope to uh, host as many students as possible starting with this first 55 group that have been uh, announced for the webinar today. Uh, we also hope that uh, this initiative will keep on uh, realizing uh, similar summer schools uh, supported by the three universities uh, in the next years, hosted in the next years by our colleagues in uh, Moscow or in Sofia. Uh, we, all, all, all the colleagues that are uh, responsible for the three bilateral agreements of the three institutions, we um, evaluate highly the realization of this specific summer school series because thereby uh, 
uh, we are sure that we can bring together both scholars and students from the three institutions and we can thereby contribute to the strengthening and deepening of the collaboration of our institutions. Uh, speaking of that, I would uh, 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 like to uh, give the floor to uh, the highest representation of uh, our three institutions and we are very happy and delighted for having this opportunity, uh, starting with uh, Professor Nikos Papayoanou, the rector of Aristotle University of the Salonis. Dear Nico, please. Thank you, uh, Grigoris. Uh, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Have a nice week. Uh, and uh, due to the COVID pandemic, probably everything is changed. But in any case, it is great honor and pleasure to attend this meeting and to welcome all of you uh, to this event. Uh, as far as I know, and Grigori said, uh, this is uh, the first summer school in cooperation with the Financial University under the government of the Russian Federation and University of National and World Economy on uh, the topic entitled uh, Sustainable Development in the Black Sea. At this point, I would like to express my devotion to the support of SDSN Black Sea, which mobilizes global scientific and technological expertise to promote practical solutions for sustainable development, including the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Climate Agreement, and of course, in the link among us. Through this adventure in our camp, we would like to enrich not only the knowledge of the attendants, but also to promote and excel excel all their abilities in order to broaden the spirit of extroversion and entrepreneurship. Our common goal, I firmly believe, is to engage our three different higher educational systems, exchange ideas and educational tools, build some stable and effective relations in the labor market, and achieve dynamic conformity between the supply and demand for highly qualified specialists of higher education. Moreover, we are here to stimulate the scientific research activity and innovations that aimed at the market economy, to modernize management system, as also to expand and strengthen the international cooperation. Therefore, I think that it's time to move into the action and let the summer school speak itself. Thank you very much for, again, for this invitation. Um, I absolutely agree uh, with uh, Grigoris, with Professor Sarotiadis, um, who uh, described uh, what will be happen in Posidi. Uh, I support all of them. And additionally, I would like also to thank Professor Theodosiu for his uh, strongly support and involvement in this uh, scientific event. Thank you very much for the invitation and have a fruitful day uh, during uh, the webinars. Thank you very much. Unmute, unmute your... Thank you, Professor Vopayoano, uh, also for uh, your contribution and your support. Uh, uh, let me now give the floor to the Rector of the University of National and World Economy, Professor Dimitrov. Dimitrov. Dear Rector, please have the floor for your <clears throat> contribution. Thank you very much, Mr. Sarotiadis. I hope that... Uh, you're hearing me because of this online uh, communications. Uh, um, good morning, uh, everyone. It is a great pleasure for me to congratulate all of the participants in this uh, very interesting summer school. I would like to congratulate all of you uh, for the enthusiasm and for the uh, your courage to uh, um, 
carry out uh, such an uh, interesting event. This uh, uh, first half of the year, you know that we passed through many uh, challenging, I would say, and uh, difficult times, COVID-19 uh, epidemic situation. And in the most universities, we have to uh, cancel some of the um, our studies and lectures or to, to go online. And uh, that's why I would like to greet uh, some uh, summer school, which uh, will uh, make uh, possible people from uh, Greece, uh, Bulgaria and Russia to meet together and to discuss such important problems as sustainable development in this, uh, uh, in this area. Uh, this uh, year, our university uh, has a jubilee. This year, we, are, we um, have 100 years from our establishment. And uh, together with our 20,000 students, 1,000 1, uh, teachers and lecturers, we had to celebrate our uh, uh, jubilee online. But uh, I hope that <laughs> it was not a problem for us. Uh, maybe you know our university from uh, initial presentation uh, many leading uh, uh, people from the government and from the business are uh, uh, educated in this university and i am glad that we are partners with such uh, very well known and uh, prestigious university in greece and russia uh, also uh, at the end of this short introduction uh, and uh, greetings to all of the participants, I hope that uh, this uh, summer school could be uh, something like uh, eye opener to all of you and a turning point uh, in your experience uh, to these problems and to the more uh, deeper cooperation between us. Uh, finally, I'm pretty much uh, uh, I pretty much like to welcome you in Bulgaria when the situation permits in one of the next two editions of the summer schools. Thank you very much for your attention and I wish you success. Thank you, uh, Director of the University of National and World Economy, uh, Professor Dimitrov. I would now kindly ask the Deputy Director for International Cooperation uh, of the Financial University under the, government, under the government of Russian Federation, Alexander Linikov, to address also uh, the first summer school. I can hear you. Do we, you hear we, him? We can't hear Alexander. Uh, I see that he's connected, but probably there must be difficulty. Yeah, we, we don't hear you, dear Alexander. I see that you are speaking, but we don't hear you. Unmute. Oh. Uh, perhaps you have to unmute it, but it's already unmuted. If I see it correctly. We will give you a few minutes in order to check what
Grigoris, what does it happen? I'm not sure. I think that for it is also it is already unmuted the mic of yeah. Uh, it, it, it seems that is unmuted. Yeah, it's yeah, seems. yeah. But uh, we let's let's wait for a while. We, we have till half past. Alexander, time. Alexander, does it hear us? Does he hear yes, us? He hear us. I think he hears us. Yes, yes. Maybe we could uh, we could uh, move to the next. Uh... The next is actually simply the one of the three, uh, the first of the three. Professor Thomas yeah? Yeah. I think that perhaps what we could do, uh, if, if this is technically feasible, uh, we could start with uh, the presentation of uh, Professor Klimova, Gale Klimova. Uh, she uh, will be giving the lecture uh, on, uh, on the first issue, uh, which is uh, Financial Instruments for Achieving Sustainable Development. Uh, I don't know, uh, Gale, can you, do you have the possibility of uh, speaking and hearing us or is it a similar problem from Moscow? I hope you can hear me. Boris, can you hear us? Oh, yes, yes, now we can Yes, okay. just a second, we uh, found the possibility to um, uh, connect from another computer. Okay, okay. okay. Here you go. <laughs> Okay. I'm sorry for this uh, small. No problem. Those are, problem. Those are uh, technical issues that may appear. It is good if they appear in the beginning. <laughs> good morning, everyone. Good morning, uh, Alexander. We can hear you now. Uh, wonderful. Your Excellency, uh, Mr. Rectors. Uh, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, students, uh, it's, a, it's an honor and a privilege to uh, participate in this fantastic event this morning. And I would like to, above all, thank the team of the project, uh, the people whose uh, uh, courage and commitment allowed uh, us to, uh, uh, um, uh, to uh, still, uh, uh, launch the summer school in this uh, incredibly difficult period. It has been a challenge for all of us uh, uh, during the end of the 2019-2020 uh, academic year. And uh, 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 we have, uh, uh, but we have nevertheless uh, achieved excellent results. And I'm confident that uh, uh, this summer school is going to be a success. I'm grateful to uh, everyone for, uh, um, for uh, taking this project through uh, and uh, making it uh, evident to, uh, um, to all the world that uh, regardless of the uh, temporary difficulties, and problems that we encounter, uh, uh, we're still going to uh, uh, take our project to, to a success. And uh, 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 the teamwork uh, is uh, particularly important uh, in our project. I would also would like uh, uh, to thank uh, our uh, international cooperation team, Professor Prikotka and Professor Shishkova, uh, and uh, all our all the teachers uh, uh, that uh, contributed their work to uh, to this project. Um, we believe that uh, this is just the start. Uh, it's just the beginning uh, of a uh, 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 of a long and successful relationship 
between our institutions that's going to uh, develop in the years to come. Um, the financial university being the financial university, uh, a hundred year old institution that specializes primarily in economics and finance, of course, is going to deliver uh, uh, lectures uh, on uh, financial institutes, uh, on, on uh, financial instruments for sustainable development. Uh, but at the same time, we are uh, very interested in hearing the contributions of our colleagues from Greece and Bulgaria. For us, it's particularly valuable. And we, we're looking forward to learning together with our students, to learning from you, uh, which will allow us to shape a, uh, uh, a better summer school in the following years. Uh, we uh, love hosting international students. Uh, it's, uh, it's not just work, but, uh, 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 but a bit of a, a challenge and a lot of fun uh, to have young people uh, from different co countries uh, study with us at the Financial University. And of course, we are uh, we're looking forward to uh, uh, sending our students to, uh, to Greece and Bulgaria. Um, this year, uh, we miss an essential social element in, in this project, uh, but we're still um, thankful for the opportunity to, uh, to meet uh, new students, uh, the colleagues that we, uh, that we haven't known personally before, uh, and work together uh, on this exciting initiative. Um, um, from my personal perspective, I, uh, uh, I love Greece and uh, uh, actually uh, 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 many of us Russian kids uh, uh, started their education with, uh, 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 with the book Myths and Legends um, of, of Ancient Greece. But to my, to my shame, I haven't yet been to Bulgaria. I'm looking forward to, uh, uh, to seeing uh, Sofia one day. Uh, so all of us, not just students, but the teachers and uh, the rectors and the deans uh, are looking forward to uh, our future relationship. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for your courage, your commitment, your work, your time. And good luck with this uh, project. It sounds silly to wish it good luck because, uh, because uh, uh, it, uh, it has already taken a successful start and without any doubt is going to develop into a, a long lasting productive relationship. Thank you, good luck, great work. Yeah, Alexander, esteemed deputy director of the Financial University under the uh, support of the government of the Russian Federation. Uh, we thank you for your contribution as well and for your support. Uh, you gave me uh, the opportunity also to thank personally uh, the people con of that make of the uh, six members organizing committee. Uh, allow me to name them starting from uh, your colleagues, Lilia Putotko, who is also a very good friend of mine uh, during the cooperations we have uh, uh, with uh, your, finance, your university. This is also the case with the other colleagues, uh, as Thank for you. instance, uh, Evelina Siskova, uh, Mikhail Musov and Dimitar Damianov from uh, the University of National and World Economy, and surely also our colleagues uh, Ilya Skioroglu and uh, Georgia Kotsia uh, from our uh, Faculty of Economic and Political Sciences in the Aristotle University. Allow me also to say in the last uh, two minutes we have before we start uh, that there are two very important networkings upon which the pre-existing bilateral cooperation of our institutions uh, are 
being based and being supported in realizing event, events like that and also other events in the future. The one is the Association of Economic Universities from the Southeastern Eastern Europe and the Black Sea, uh, ASECU, where all three universities are prom prominent members of it, of this association. Uh, and the other one is uh, uh, the SDSN Black Sea. Uh, it is a relatively newly established uh, um, uh, network. Uh, it is the chapter for responsible for the Black Sea for the promotion of uh, SDGs, of the United Nations SDGs. And it is, uh, it is located in Aristotle University. I would kindly ask Professor Thadosiu to say just a few words about that, and then we can start with the actual program. Nico? Well, th thank you, Gregoris. Uh, first of all, let me uh, congratulate the organizing uh, team. It's, uh, uh, under these uh, very difficult circumstances, they managed to, uh, uh, to initiate and to host uh, such an interesting um, event. Uh, um, it's very nice to, to have the opportunity to meet, uh, to meet you all. We would prefer, of course, um, that uh, uh, you would be here in, um, in Greece and enjoy the sun and the sea. But um, we'll, um, uh, we'll focus on that uh, probably next uh, year. Oh, as far as um, uh, SDSN Black Sea is concerned, uh, this is one of the, um, it's a network uh, uh, that operates under the auspices of the Secretary General of the United Nations. Uh, and there are uh, uh, a number of uh, such networks, either national or regional networks uh, that uh, cover almost uh, uh, all, all, all the globe. Uh, the, uh, the purpose of these uh, networks is to provide solutions for the implementation of, for the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, the United Nations have identified that uh, in order to be able to, to achieve the implementation of the, of the SDGs, we need the new ideas, we need the new perspectives, and these uh, new ideas and perspectives uh, may come from uh, universities and research institutions. So they initiated these uh, networks uh, in order to, to acquire uh, solutions to uh, suggestions for the implementation of the SDGs. One of these networks is our network, SDS in Black Sea. It uh, comprises 12 countries from the Balkans, all the countries um, around the, the Black Sea up to the uh, Caspian. It's a, it's a huge um, network. I will give you some information uh, later on in uh, my presentation. Uh, if you're interested, you can uh, uh, join, and we want um, uh, many universities to join these uh, networks because we really believe that uh, the cause is um, is uh, noble. Um, so uh, it, it, these are networks that um, uh, focus on providing solutions for the implementation of the SDGs. This network, the SDSM Black Sea, was um, uh, launched. Uh, in um, 2018, uh, less than two years ago. Uh, it is hosted by our university, by Aristotle University of um, Thessaloniki. Uh, I have the privilege of being the chair of uh, this network with um, the Rigoris and um, uh, other colleagues from our university and from uh, uh, universities representing the 12 countries of, uh, um, that comprise the, the network. Uh, but I will give more information um, in my presentation later on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nico. So, dear colleagues, we are waiting for you all, students and professors. Uh, as Alexander said, next year in uh, Thessaloniki, in Kalkiviki. And now I would uh, give the floor to Yoria Kotsia. She will coordinate the lectures, which uh, We'll start with the contribution of Galle Klimova. So, uh, you're here, please. All right, should I start? All right, dear colleagues, uh, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here today. I would like to join in in a sentiment expressed earlier by my colleagues. This is a wonderful collaboration. Thank you so much all for doing this. I would particularly like to thank our students for joining us today, uh, given that it's summer, and it is a wonderful, wonderful topic to be um, learning about. 
in these times. Okay, so with that, and without much further ado, I'd like to share my presentation with you. Please let me know as soon as you can see it on your screen. Uh, I would like to make this presentation a little more interactive. So I would I will be asking you questions from the presentation, and I would like you to participate in that. So if you have an answer, if you have an opinion, please uh, unmute yourselves and ask either a question or give me your answers. Sounds good? All right, I'm going to take your silence as a good sign. Yes, of course, of course. All right, perfect. Let's see. All right, so uh, wait. Uh, like a lot of my colleagues uh, pointed out earlier, uh, the, the sustainable development comes in the context of sustainable development goals that were developed and adopted by the UN. Now, uh, my first question would be to our students, and I would like you to um, point out if you, how much do you know about the issue? How much do you know about the topic? Are you familiar with the sustainable development goals? What is their essence? Can you name uh, any? Don't be shy. All right, well, let's give you some time to adjust. Uh, I'll guess in that case, I will just do it myself, give you a brief introduction. So the guiding framework within which we'll be discussing the financial instruments that um, facilitate sustainable development is the framework of the 17 sustainable development goals that were adopted by the UN in, in September 2015. Now, uh, the goal here, the actual aim is that they should be achieved ideally by 2030, which means that whatever means and methods we have, we should focus on them at this point because trust me, as we will soon find out, there's still a lot of financing gaps. There's still a lot of financing opportunities out there that are yet to be filled in order for us to succeed in achieving at least some of those goals. All right, so as you can see on this table in the middle, uh, here are the 17 goal, goals. Now, some of those are universally applicable no matter what country you live in, no matter what part of the world you're from, you can probably relate to those goals. Some of them will include no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being. You know, there's still uh, pretty much every country in the world that is still struggling uh, with some of those uh, key issues. However, if we're looking at the Black Sea countries, well, naturally, we could look at uh, some of the sustainable uh, development goals, such as life below water, right, would be one of the more natural ones. Uh, clean water and sanitation for some of us. Um, and then climate action, na naturally, and uh, clean energy. All right, so let's actually look further into um, you know, what opportunities in terms of financing exist out there. Uh, what can we do about financing and developing the financial framework in order to accomplish those goals? Now, another thing to mention about this is that naturally it's understood that most of the funding needs will be met by the public sector, uh, meaning the governments, municipalities that will be covering most of the, uh, most of the needs. However, this is not possible. Uh, the achievement of those goals is not possible without the private sector involvement. The following uh, presentation will be mostly focused on the financial instruments that the private sector can use in order to attract additional funding, attract finances, in order to uh, finance projects and create solutions to uh, facilitate the uh, accomplishment of those goals. All right, on this slide, what you could see is, um, it's kind of a scheme, right? So in order to provide context for the opportunities and examples, this chart over here, this picture, depicts um, a very simplified view of the global financial system, right? So importantly, uh, it shows how the financial system relates to the real economy, which is the one that is being the most affected, which is the one that's actually doing the, accomplishing the deed. 
Uh, so we're, we can see the main sources of capital uh, and we can see the key stakeholders and financial flows. Now policies, rules, regulations, structures, and incentives shape the framework within which financial institutions take decisions. Um, something to note is that the total, so according to the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, uh, which we can abbreviate to you in CTAD, uh, they estimate that to meet the SDGs by 2030, the total amount of, the, of annual investments in SDG related sectors uh, in developing countries specifically will need to be between $3.3 trillion and $4.5 trillion. So you can appreciate the amount uh, of money that is involved in here that is still needed on the annual basis to accomplish the need, uh, the goals. Okay, uh, so to break those down a little further, we can see that such estimates mean uh, that there is an annual financing gap of uh, some 2.5 trillion uh, between current funding and what is required. A closer look at the sectoral level suggests significant investment gaps with some of the largest funding needs related to economic infrastructure. So um, at up to $950 billion, power infrastructure carries the greatest financing need followed by climate change mitigation, which is valued at $850 billion. Uh, infra trans transport infrastructure comes uh, at a third place with $770 billion. These are again, estimates of the UN. Uh, there's also a sizable investment gap in social infrastructure, ranging from $140 billion in health to $250 billion in education. And I understand it might be difficult to follow what I'm saying, but what you should be really doing is just looking at the tables over um, here on the screen, and it will be easier for you to follow those. Uh, the IMF published a uh, recent paper uh, where they estimated that meeting the SDGs in five priority areas, including the Black Sea countries, um, in, so five priority areas being the education, health, roads, electricity, and water, and sanitation. So by 2030, those five areas will require additional private and public annual spending of $528 billion for low and lower middle income countries, and $2.1 trillion for emerging countries which are most of the uh, black country, black, uh, black sea countries um, are part of the emerging economies. Uh, these estimates are comparable to those from a UNC uh, CTAD for similar sector grouping, roads, electricity, and water and sanitation. So looking at the infrastructure financing gap, in uh, a 2019 World Bank report found that the cost for new SDG related infrastructure could range from $637 billion or 2% of GDP to $2.74 trillion, otherwise known as 8% of GDP in low and middle income countries. We'll call them LMISC. Um, depending on the spending efficiency and the quality of services uh, delivered. Investments of 4.5% of GDP will allow those countries to reach uh, the infrastructure related SDGs and stay on track to limit climate change to supposedly two degrees Celsius. Again, these are um, estimates by the World Bank uh, with assistance from the UN. In addition to new infrastructure spending needs, LMISC uh, would need to spend between 1.9 and 3.8% of GDP, 2.7% using uh, the preferred scenario uh, per year to maintain their existing and new infrastructure. 
Consequently, with a preferred spending scenario, the overall investments required would be uh, in the order of 7.2% 7 7 of GDP. Okay. Um, now, the private sector accounts for only 9 to 13% uh, of total infrastructure investments in those countries. Now, um, what might be important to do here is to exclude China as Chinese infrastructure investments are public rather than, than private. So for more accurate counting, uh, we want to exclude that. And uh, without it, the private sector involvement increases substantially and the portion gets to 14 to uh, 31 percent. Okay, so recent trends in uh, PPI investments in developing countries show greater private sector participation in transport and energy more specifically. More than half of PPI investments in the first half of 2018 were in transport and less than two fifths in the energy sector. Information and communication technology, ICT, and water and sanitation represent a small proportion of PPI investments in developing countries. A closer look at income levels reveals some disparities in sectoral PPI investments. So in the first half of 2018, investments in the energy sector represented about two thirds of total PPI investments in low and lower middle income countries, while they were only one fourth in, uh, in the upper uh, middle income countries. Okay, I guess these will be more representative of those numbers. This slide uh, for you would be easier to look at those numbers one more time. But then again, hopefully those presentations will be distributed to the students so they could have a closer look at the, uh, at the numbers. Now, the reason why we were talking about all those things is because we want to establish uh, an idea of what kind of a market we're dealing with here. Uh, the next step for us is to delve deeper into the possible solutions that will address those funding needs, those funding gaps. So uh, our next step is to look at uh, the possible uh, financial instruments that are most uh, that garner the most focus from the UN more specifically, because even they consider those to be the most convenient and the most appropriate in terms of attracting financing, attracting funding to the um, SDG solutions. So you, um, UN's focus is actually on bonds as the uh, only financing mechanism that cuts across a broad set of actors involved in the realization of the SDGs, including companies, governments, cities, assets, infrastructure projects, public-private partnerships, you name it, it's probably uh, achievable through um, financing through fixed income securities, such as bonds. Uh, the bond market is also a long-term lower risk asset class that matches the profile of SDG activities and has enough scale with uh, about $6.7 trillion of annual issuance to fill the SDG financing gap. Okay, so the other focus is on financing the SDGs in the emerging markets. Uh, since there is, uh, this is where investments are most needed and where access to capital is most limited and expensive. In these markets, sovereign bonds and foreign direct investments are the main source of stability. In least developed countries, FDI is the primary source of financing after official uh, development assistance and remittances. Through FDI, uh, multinational companies with significant operations in emerging markets and access to global capital markets can significantly contribute to the SDGs. By extension, corporate finance can become a major source of SDG investments through corporate bonds and equity that support an integrated SDG strategy in emerging markets. Now, the immense financing gap for the SDGs, uh, the trillions of dollars that we discussed earlier, and might I add that uh, trillions of dollars per annum uh, that are needed in the emerging markets, create a unique market opportunity 
for the multitude of actors involved in achieving the SDGs and that all contribute to tremendous um, investment opportunities. And many of those opportunities can be financed through fixed income, uh, more specifically bond market. So uh, in this section, uh, we will define a broad portfolio of fixed income SDG investments, ranging from large corporations and banks developing market solutions for the SDGs to national and subnational governments looking to fund public programs related to the SDGs. Okay, so uh, on this slide, you can see the brief outline of the five asset classes that we'll be looking at, the five uh, particular instruments that we'll be looking at in more detail. And let's start with corporate SDG bonds, non-financial. So the new business models, markets or sources of payment for SDG related activities can become attractive investment opportunities for companies and can be financed through corporate bonds. Companies, tra companies transitioning uh, to these uh, sustainable business models are expected to have subnational capital needs for research and development, human resources, uh, physical assets, and other corporate activities. Uh, so, okay, so these include uh, companies operating in prime SDG sectors and geographies. Uh, those could be companies adopting new circular or inclusive business models, uh, companies addressing new markets and consumers for sustainable goods and services, or finally, financial institutions such as banks, uh, hedge funds, um, some other type of, types of financial institutions, sometimes private equity plays a huge role in those, uh, providing consumer finance and other services that support sustainable consumption uh, or access to essential, uh, to essential products and services. Uh, now, companies can finance uh, their SDG activities using general funds raised through traditional corporate finance mechanism, right? Uh, however, such financing makes it difficult for investors to identify uh, companies that meaningfully contribute to the SDGs. Also, financing SDG-related activities through generic financial products makes it harder to determine whether the funds are actually used for those purposes and if the investment has a credible impact on the SDGs. So one solution to that problem is to introduce SDG-themed bonds with corporate governance mechanisms to ensure that investments are directed toward SDG related activities. Uh, this kind of an approach reveals the final impact of corporate activities, the what, uh, as well as the way they were executed, the how. The process of issuing such bonds provides an opportunity for companies to communicate with capital markets and differentiate themselves from less sustainable peers. Through bond documentation and structure, companies can formulate a credible theory and strategy for SDG impact. Now, they can allocate specific assets or resources to implement the strategy and commit to credible governance mechanisms that ensure transparent monitoring of activities and results. Uh, these SDG bonds can take the form of use of proceeds bonds, uh, whereby companies can identify specific assets or projects that contribute to the SDGs and commit to a strict accountability on use of proceeds bonds. So in the absence of such assets and projects, or if companies are looking to finance a more comprehensive SDG strategy at a corporate level, uh, corporate SDG bonds can be used as general purpose bonds with a commitment to accountability on the general use of proceeds and corporate level impacts. Okay, so to date, uh, there has not been a single SDG bond issued by companies in real economy sectors. Uh, however, 
some social bonds have been issued by real economy companies with social projects that contribute to the SDGs. In addition, many corporate green bonds have social elements, suggesting that companies are looking to expand the scope of activities they finance through the use of proceed bond model. Furthermore, some companies and investors are interested in leveraging general purpose bonds to support a corporate level strategy to contrib contribute to the SDGs. Now, importantly, corporate bonds can be a critical source of SDG finance in emerging markets. First, depending on the sophistication of local markets and companies, emerging markets companies can uh, raise money directly through local and international capital markets through corporate bonds that support the company's SDG related projects, assets, or strategy. A second, multinational companies that are based in developed or developing markets and have access to broad, deep, and global uh, capital markets can raise capital through bonds and use these funds to make direct investments in these markets. Uh, through foreign direct investments as being the primary means. Okay, so this is particularly relevant in less developed countries where capital markets are also less developed and FDI is one of the main sources of external funding. Now, the role of FDI in promoting SDG investment in emerging markets is addressed in a later section. We'll talk about this more extensively. Okay, now uh, let's switch to... Uh, the next financial instrument, but the, before that, and just for the sake of seeing if anyone is still awake there, um, my question is to the students. How many fixed income instruments can you name? Can you name any? So we know that there are corporate bonds, right? Any company can, well, most of the companies can issue uh, bonds to finance their operations. What other types of fixed income instruments, probably bond related, can you name? Any ideas? Uh, yeah, I can try to give my idea, if I may. Go ahead, yep. Uh, if I understood your question correctly, uh, then, then I may say that uh, another way of uh, having fixed income instruments, another example of that uh, could be the guaranteed investment certificates. Uh, this is not particularly bond related, but uh, when we speak about uh, bonds, there are also the type of bonds which are saving bonds. This could also be named as uh, the fixed income instruments. Uh, and to be honest, mm -hmm. I don't remember others, but uh, I hope that I was correct with my answer. Okay, yeah, thank you. And now my follow-up question to you is, uh, do you think that there are any ways that you can link uh, the fixed income instruments that you just named to uh, the possibility of accomplishing the SDG goals that we outlined earlier? Uh, yes, of course. Because uh, the main goals of SDGs, uh, as understood from your presentation, is uh, to lower to lower the uh, gap between the needed financing and the financing that uh, we see at the moment. Because it is, uh, in reality, it is uh, too low. So uh, I was speaking about uh, guaranteed investment certificates. Uh, they could be granted uh, to sustain this funding and uh, the saving bonds are uh, also type of bonds which could uh, help with the financing and uh, uh, with the ways to increase the overall uh, amount of uh, finances needed in the sustainable development. Okay, um, possibly, right? So the key here is that there should be some kind of documentation that will um, make your investors understand 
the ultimate um, the ultimate goal being accomplished there. So the ultimate um, project or solution that the money the investor uh, gives uh, in exchange for the bond or in exchange for the fixed income instrument go into. Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, we may uh, name uh, this goal as uh, we can take a sector, let's say uh, the food sector, which you told that uh, would need uh, much more financing in the coming years and uh, say that uh, developing this sector is our goal. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you. So good examples. Anyone else has any other uh, fixed income examples? All right. All right. So at least from what I understand, you get the concept of what we're trying to do here. So Artyom, thank you so much for uh, pitching in. Um, yeah, I'm listening. I okay. just uh, thank you. <laughs> All right, perfect. All right. So from uh, the looks of it, you're, you're understanding the concept here. So going further, basically what we will be doing is kind of reiterating how each specific fixed income instrument might be aiding in the financing the, uh, uh, the SDG solutions. And I will give you four more examples of those. Um, those are also the ones that were uh, actively um, uh, being the active focus of the UN uh, in order to accomplish the SDGs. Okay, so following the corporate SDG bonds, let's move on to the SDG bonds by banks and financial institutions. Well, let's see what the distinctions are between the corporate bonds and the SDG bonds by banks and, and financial institutions in the context of the um, uh, funding gaps that exist in the uh, SDG solutions uh, business out there. Okay, so a larger banks and uh, financial institutions, they can raise funds on global capital markets and in turn provide loans uh, or other non-capital market financial products supporting the SDGs. Such financial intermediation is critical because it makes capital available for activities or issuers who do not have access to public markets. This is often the case with smaller uh, SDG solution projects. Uh, financial intermediation also leverages the original investment into many more investments or financing at the local level with high potential impact. Okay, so it's kind of an aggregation and securitization here as well uh, that plays a great um, a role in the um, proliferation of those products. Okay, um, so examples would include mortgages, loans, credit solutions uh, to support financial inclusion. Um, another example would be loans or credit solutions. Uh, they can finance consumption of SDG related products. Uh, such as energy efficient, um, efficient energy or renewable energy. Uh, and uh, the final example that I'd like to make are the leases to finance circular economy models. A, if a done at the local level, financial intermediation can also result in a local transfer of ownership of the business and financial assets. So driving economic and social development along with that. Uh, it can also trigger a multiplier effect of money creation. So that is typical in a well-functioning economy, right? So I hope you guys are still familiar or still remember what money creation or money multiplier is. Yes, no? Maybe. All right, hopefully you do. Um, 
All right, uh, going back to our bonds, this is particularly important in emerging markets uh, where capital markets are less developed and local companies and individuals are more reliant on loans from local financial institutions. All right, so as opposed to seeking it on international markets, as opposed to raising funds on the broader um, international arena. Okay, so a growing proportion of green bonds are issued by financing co financial companies. Uh, and to make an example, in 2018, green bond issuance by financial companies uh, more than doubled, uh, raise, uh, reaching uh, $49.2 billion and uh, consisting of 29.4% of the overall market. Uh, in addition, so if you want to appreciate that, that's basically, it's over a quarter, right? It's a lot, it, it, it's, a pretty good, uh, it's a pretty good number. In addition, many social bonds and sustainability bonds, including all those designated as SDG bonds, were issued by financial institutions. So for example, uh, the commercial banks ANZ, HSBC, and Societe Generale have raised capital from public investors uh, to finance their commercial and other banking activities in support of the SDGs. Uh, SDG bonds can also be issued by multilateral regional and national development banks. Uh, they can leverage the capital of donor countries to fund sustainable development projects. Uh, for example, uh, the World Bank leverages its AAA credit rating to issue between 50 and 60 uh, billion dollars in the global capital markets every year. Uh, those proceeds support development programs aligned with the SDGs naturally. Uh, those uh, types of um, capital raising activities, uh, finance projects that include access to healthcare, so they provide access to healthcare, uh, they improve waste management, uh, solve some of the water problems, so water purification, life below water. Uh, so it addresses some of those goals, uh, addresses the goals of sanitation and rehabilitation of ecosystems. Now, development banks can borrow on the private capital markets on favorable financial conditions uh, based on their government backing and high credit rating. Uh, and in turn, this capital can be used to finance programs and activities that support the implementation of the SDGs. Recently, the World Bank partnered with a Swedish insurance company, Folksam Group, to issue $350 million uh, worth of bonds for specific development activities aligned with the SDGs. Now, quick question to you. Do you guys know of any examples of world banks or uh, local national banks that issued, uh, issued bonds, fixed income instruments in order to finance uh, projects that might lead to the accomplishment of the SDGs? Are you familiar with any examples of um, development banks or a world or the World Bank or some of the national uh, banks? Maybe Unicredit Bank. Mm -hmm. Well, not exactly a uh, World Bank, but sure. Okay. What, they, what do they do? Can you give me a specific case of the I don't know exactly, but if I'm not mistaken, 
uh, they issued uh, their own bonds, but um, I don't know exactly. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, indeed. So here's the <laughs> kind of the trick, tricky part with all of this. Um, it is easy for any, most of the banks to issue bonds at least in the domestic markets. Uh, for international banks, it's usually even more convenient to do so on the broader international market, just because they can get better quotes from a larger public, from the larger audience uh, buyer pool. Now, the problem with this is, and it's probably what the Maxime is struggling with at this point, is the fact that it's not always clear where the proceeds will go to or what um, uh, projects, what activities the bank will finance uh, with the proceeds from the uh, sale of the bonds. Now, oftentimes you will find it in the documentation in the roadmap of um, the new issuance uh, that you know, the bank will list the, uh, the activities, the supposed activities that they will pursue with the uh, with the sale or with the issuance of, uh, of their bonds. However, what we're looking here at specifically is the need for those institutions, in this case, more particularly banks, is to identify the specific SDG related activities or um, some sorts of solutions that uh, the money can be uh, funneled towards. And that in particular might attract an additional cohort of investors that are seeking to allocate their capital towards um, green, sustainable uh, development in uh, either specific countries or in the world in general. Okay. Um, so yeah, if you remember anything out of this, is look at the documentation of any financial or of any financial instrument in general, but in our case, more specifically, the fixed in instrument um, origination documentation, and see where exactly and how exactly the institution that is raising the money for the capital for is going to direct the proceeds to. How are they going to use the cash? And since we're talking about the SDG solutions, uh, if you are looking to allocate your cash or if you're looking to raise capital through a financial institution, uh, through uh, fixed income instruments, it's your um, absolute, uh, it's your obligation to put it in there that this is where the money's going to. That this is the kind of a project, the sustainability project that you're trying to finance in order to uh, accomplish one or several of the SDG goals. Okay. Yeah, could I ask a question at this Go point? Ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, so uh, it is not the first time when you're talking about uh, the allocation of financing from the um, uh, <laughs> allocation of funds which comes from financing and uh, I was wondering if there are any organs, any uh, organization which could uh, control this allocation because uh, as you already said it is uh, difficult to understand where the cash goes. That's an excellent question <laughs> you're asking here. So uh, the broad answer is it depends. In the more specific details, it depends on the type of institution that is raising the funds. So naturally, when an institution is raising funds, uh, raising capital, and it is doing it through uh, official means or through the public markets, uh, what it is doing, it is, it is issuing documentation, origination documentation. Now, in any country out there, and in most cases, there are supernatural organizations out there that monitor um, the efficacy of, uh, of the financial markets, of the public financial markets, which in the private as well, uh, naturally. Some countries have a more developed system of monitoring uh, financial markets, financial institutions. Uh, some countries have less developed uh, controls out there. Um, 
maybe we shall not name any names at this point, but naturally you probably are, you probably are familiar with an institution such, such as the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission in the United States. Yes, of course. Uh, which will be in charge, uh, which, which is basically in charge of the um, uh, legal issues uh, related to the financial markets and financial institutions in the United States. So, uh, in other words, if a uh, financial institution or a company issues um, a financial instrument, in this case, a fixed uh, income instrument, and in its origination documentation, it identifies a certain, a certain um, specific uh, activity or project or intent that it is um, considering or planning on uh, funding with the proceeds from the sale of the fixed income instrument, then should the company falter, should the company um, not deliver on that promise, supposedly the uh, investors, or in this case, the bondholders, um, could take it up with the SEC. Also, supposedly, uh, the SEC in this case would be conducting some kind of annual reviews, right, or regular reviews, uh, to be more precise, um, to basically monitor the uh, efficacious use of the funds that were uh, uh, that the company possesses. So if they said they were going to finance a project of uh, water purification in um, I don't know in the rest, in the affected uh, regions of the uh, Atlantic Ocean uh, from the I don't know. Uh, oil pumping activities down there, then it better be doing exactly that. Well, number one, uh, many organizations in the United States will be interested in the company doing exactly that because most likely they will be getting a, a tax break or a tax cut from it. So the IRS will be right up there with the SEC on their necks, making sure that this is where the money's going to. <laughs> yeah. Uh, All right, thank you. I see now. I see now. So it depends on the country, uh, basically. If the country is not that developed, then uh, this may be not uh, regulated at this uh, level as the Americans do. Precisely. Exactly right. Yeah, all right. Thanks a lot. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, and again, most European countries have that under control. Um, okay. Now, uh, unless there are any further questions, and you're always welcome to ask. Uh, let's move on to the next fixed income asset, uh, fixed income instrument. And this one is the asset-backed and project SDG bonds. Okay, uh, now non-corporate non assets and projects can also form the uh, basis for SDG investments. Most commonly, uh, standalone infrastructure projects, uh, those not financed um, through corporate balance sheets, can be funded using uh, fixed income financial products uh, based on stability of the cash flow they generate and the value of the underlying asset. So for example, uh, the financing for a bridge or a road can be based on toll revenues tied to the general driving activity, all right? Uh, while these infrastructure projects are typically financed through bank loans, uh, banks often refinance such loans and they sell them as securities on the bond market uh, once the project is complete. Operational and no longer carries construction risk. Uh, that bonds can also be a vehicle to finance smaller financial assets that contribute to the SDGs and are spun off from the balance sheets of companies or banks. And by the by, um, from the description that I just uh, explained to you, maybe some of you can draw parallels to um, the kind of financial instruments, the kind of 
fixed income instruments uh, that were uh, very popular in the market uh, worldwide, but more specifically in the United States uh, back before 2008. Anyone? Uh, probably. Mortgage backed. Yeah. Sorry. Mortgage backed securities, for instance. Uh huh. Exactly. Anyone else? Yeah, basically, Casimir, you're completely correct. Uh, mortgage backed securities. So it's the same principle of pooling and securitizing um, a multitude of different loans with different profiles and different credit ratings. Um, in the ideal world and what the securitization of those uh, different profile loans d accomplishes is it accomplishes a more diverse um, pool of, uh, of loans. So in case, you know, a, a portion of those goes bankrupt, you still have the more uh, higher qualified borrowers out there, more responsible borrowers out there that will not de default on those loans and will cover uh, for the ones that did default. Uh, thus, you can have a higher than uh, average uh, rate of return uh, or interest rate on those fixed income securities. However, uh, your uh, risks will be mitigated by the more responsible uh, participants, by the more responsible borrowers. Now, uh, the reason why I'm bringing this up is in order for uh, the asset back and project SDG bonds to uh, be securitized successfully and not lead to a pyramid scheme that we all observed and probably felt on our own skin back in 08 is to uh, carefully monitor the uh, stage of completeness and the quality of those projects that are being financed through uh, the instruments, through the fixed income instruments. So you wanna make sure that those are, before they go into the pool, before they are being securitized, uh, those projects are complete. They generate cash flow and they do not carry significant risks uh, in terms of uh, even starting launching the project. Usually that's uh, construction risk, okay? All right, good catch, guys. All right, uh, so uh, back to the uh, smaller financial assets uh, that contribute to the SDGs that are spun off from the balance sheet of companies or banks. Uh, now, examples of those would include leases uh, for electric vehicles, uh, loans for residential solar panels, uh, loans to small farmers, and small and medium enterprises, so the SMEs. Uh, in areas of population with little access to finance, so oftentimes it could be microfinance or some other types of uh, funding of the sort. So while these financial assets are too small and risky to be financed on the bond market on a standalone basis, uh, they can be pooled together and securitized, just like we discussed before. And uh, that would be in the form of a bond. Uh, but then again, you would have to be very careful to make sure those products are standardized for, for cohesion and coherency. Uh, pooling of assets, um, that's a form of financial intermediation in which funds raised on capital markets can be used to finance projects on asset or assets uh, that are too small. Okay, so we've talked about that, right? Uh, it is related to the financial intermediation role that banks play and share some of the same multiplier effects. So for more, uh, uh, we'll, for more on this topic, we'll, we'll talk a little more about this later in the game. Uh, about banks and financial institution, uh, institutions. But to date, uh, there have not been any issuances of asset-backed or project SDG bonds. Uh, however, many green bonds have been issued. Uh, those were used to finance infrastructure and financial assets. 
So uh, in 2017, asset-backed and mortgage-backed securities represented 15% of the green bond market uh, with $24.6 billion in issuance. So the scope of the market could easily be expanded to a broader range uh, of topics covered in the SDGs. Okay. With that, okay. uh, let's... Excuse yep. me, um, Professor Klimova, I want to remind you that you have uh, another 10 minutes. Only 10, okay, thank you. I appreciate that. You're welcome, thank you. Yeah. I thought it was an hour and a half that I had in total. Okay, uh, thank you. Hi, it is an hour and a half yet, just um, in order to have more time um, for discussion, but because as we saw discussion started already during your presentation, you, you could uh, have more minutes because you are having the discussion during the presentation, so that's okay. At I appreciate least, that. At least 25 minutes more is your time. Okay, thank you, I appreciate it. All right. All right, uh, so with that, um, let's move to uh, sovereign SDG bonds. Uh, so, Okay, let's talk a little uh, more about the sovereign involvement. So this is more of a public sector involvement, right? In the matters of uh, accomplishing the SDGs. Now, while the private sector plays a significant role in the achieving of the SDGs, right? Like we said, the public sector alone cannot pull it off. However, many of the goals and targets cannot be fulfilled by the private sector alone and they require either direct or indirect intervention by the government. So um, as an example, uh, public services around poverty uh, alleviation or health and education. So governments can tap into the private capital market to finance these public or public private initiatives, right? So hybrid, uh, hybrid initiatives. They often use the bond market to finance their activities and programs uh, at a low cost of capital. Right, naturally you can understand that the sovereign credit rating is usually higher than most of the private institutions uh, in the country. So based on their ability to collect taxes and their general credit worthiness is what we can say about it in simple terms. Okay, these are known as sovereign bonds and uh, they represent a sizable part of the global bond market. Uh, governments can issue sovereign bonds that are tied to SDG related programs and they follow a strict governance process to ensure the credibility of the impact, including monitoring and reporting. So for investors, sovereign SDG bonds can be compelling investment vehicles to achieve SDG impact. Uh, investing in these bonds can support government implementing country specific SDG plans and investors can also benefit from diversifying their portfolios of SDG investments. Uh, focusing on different types of issuers and activities, but at the same time keeping their overall credit uh, rating level at a pretty high standard. So sovereign bonds play an important role in financing the SDGs in emerging markets more specifically. Uh, while the market is relatively small when compared uh, to the developed markets, right? So the United States is probably the absolute winner in this case in terms of the market size and volume. Uh, however, the uh, the best solution for the emerging markets in this case is probably through the sovereign, uh, sovereign issuers. Uh, but while the market is relatively small when compared with the developed markets, uh, bonds issued by governments represent an important source of outside financing in the EMs. And according to the International Monetary Fund, the total market capitalization of emerging market sovereign debt 
stood at just over $7.3 trillion in 2016. While the global market for sovereign debt is expected to reach $50 trillion in 2019. 11 uh, with the United, uh, yeah, just with the United States and Japan representing about half of the market. So about 25 or even $26 trillion uh, in 2019 were uh, sovereign debt from the US and Japan. So the market for uh, emerging market sovereign bonds is also growing. Uh, alongside the corporate bond market based on interest uh, from both issuers and investors and successfully, successful efforts uh, by many countries to improve their investment climate, including through sustainable development. Uh, okay, so my next question is actually again to you guys. So we've talked about sovereign SDG bonds. But what would you say would be the next best thing? So oftentimes countries on the, uh, on the broad level, right, on the government level, they may understand the needs that the country has. But what about the lo localities? What about the municipalities? What about the cities or states in some cases? Uh, do you think that those... Um, smaller cells of the, of the overall country might know better how to handle their, uh, their projects, their solutions, what exactly they need uh, for the accomplishment of the SDGs and how those um, solutions might be best implemented. Do you think that would be a fair uh, assessment? And if it is, what are the solutions that those uh, smaller units of government uh, could use in order to finance the SDG activities? Anyone? What are the uh, financial instruments that uh, smaller units of government, so for instance, uh, city governments or municipality governments or state governments uh, can use in order to uh, finance uh, SDG solutions or their local needs in general? Anyone? Funds, maybe? Funds? I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear you quite well. Uh, yeah, funds. Funds, okay, yeah. So uh, what you're saying is basically hedge funds, uh, public funds? Um, investment funds. Investment funds, okay. Yeah, sure, they can attract investment funds to uh, contribute capital, to invest capital into their needs. Excellent idea. How would they do that? Well, uh, one of the ways they can do it is through m issuing municipal bonds. And those are typically issued by municipalities. Uh, all right, so municipal bonds, uh, let's talk a little, a little more about their profile and what uh, they're meant to accomplish. So they can provide a meaningful response to the financing gap for sustainable development in the context of broad infrastructure needs. So urbanization and sometimes challenging political environments at the national level. Uh, one of the one of the more glaring examples is probably the United States, since they have probably one of the most developed municipal bond markets out there. Um, to some extent, also Japan. Um, their municipal bond markets have developed into a major asset class with increasing interest from international non-tax exempt investors. 
uh, just to clarify, so one of the reasons why municipal bonds in the United States have gained so much popularity, uh, so much traction, is because uh, they're um, tax exempt on the state uh, income tax level. So uh, based on low risks and diversification benefits, uh, international investors, those that are non-tax exempt, have also uh, expressed plenty of interest in those vehicles. At the same time, municipal bonds typically finance projects with a strong focus on um, economic and social development, uh, making them an ideal vehicle to finance a broad range of sustainable development priorities. In uh, 2018, uh, the Climate Board Initiative, the CBI, conducted a study of the market for um, climate-aligned municipal bonds in the United States uh, on whether or, not, whether or not they were labeled as green or climate. Now, an interesting finding uh, of theirs was that $264 billion of bonds outstanding from, one from 1,436 municip municipal issuers with 95% of revenue derived from climate solutions in the areas of water, transport, waste, energy, and land protection for conservation projects. Uh, CBI found that most climate-aligned uh, U.S. municipal bonds were not labeled as green bonds, which is quite startling uh, considering the overall push for, um, actually from the investor side, uh, both private individuals, private capital, and um, larger capital pools such as hedge funds, um, corporations, et cetera. Uh, for, uh, for green projects out there. And yet the municipalities in, even in the United States, it, even given the fact that what they're actually using the proceeds from the money uh, to is uh, green projects, they're not labeling their bonds as green. Uh, to give you more particular examples of non-labeled municipal bonds uh, in the green sector, uh, they included rail projects, flood defenses, or sewage treatment uh, in most cases. Uh, on the other hand, in the social space, uh, they included affordable housing, uh, public education, not-for-profit health care, and infrastructure, such as bridges uh, or parks. Uh, as with climate-aligned bonds, uh, there is an opportunity to identify and rebrand a broad category of municipal bonds that focuses on essential services from economic and social development uh, in line with the SDGs and promote a uh, thriving market for uh, municipal, municipal SDG bonds. Now, in emerging markets, uh, the municipal bond market is only nascent. Uh, and so far, only cities with deeper financial resources have issued municipal bonds. Uh, examples of that would include Rio, uh, Mumbai, Sao Paulo, Johannesburg. Uh, however, the market is growing based on investor interest and countries' efforts to improve their investment climate. Uh, so, for example, uh, India has issued a guidance note on municipal bond financing for infrastructure investments uh, with recommendations to enhance credit worthiness, the regulatory framework, and the process of bond issuance. So this is, again, one of those topics, uh, one of those um, examples that we can learn from and adopt in our uh, current realities. As we can see, India has already picked up on it and is actively trying to implement it. Uh, so in addition, uh, infrastructure and other sustainable development needs create vast opportunities for sustainable investment in cities. Uh, in the climate space alone, the uh, International Finance Corporation 
estimates that an investment opportunity of $29.4 trillion exists across six key sectors in emerging markets, uh, emerging market cities uh, between 2018 and 2030. So basically 12 year time period, time frame. Uh, this includes areas where municipal finance can play a key role, um, such as electric vehicles, uh, right? I'll remember Elon Musk, uh, $1.6 trillion worth um, of market opportunity, public transport with, uh, a public, with the finance gap of um, public transport infrastructure, actually, in general, uh, $1 trillion. Climate smart water, $1 trillion once again. Uh, renewable energy at $800 billion. And uh, municipal solid waste management, $200, trillion, uh, $200 billion uh, worth of a market opportunity. Now, ultimately, however, the growth of emerging markets, uh, municipal SDG bonds will depend on decentralization of the, in these countries and delegation of power, which is necessary for uh, municipalities and the smaller units of government to issue their own uh, bonds or fixed income instruments. Uh, that will require a uh, delegation of power in terms of a tax collection, uh, and that would be relegated to cities and municipalities in, uh, in the ideal world. Uh, now, according to the uh, IFC, in two 2013, only 4% of the 500 largest cities in developing countries had access to international debt markets and only 20% were credit worthy in local markets. Now, since then the situation has uh, improved somewhat, however, there's still a lot of room for further uh, development. Okay, um, here's a little bit of a, a map in terms of um, the funding gaps that are still in existence and will continue to be there through, uh, through this decade, all the way up to 2030. So you can use that in order to identify the most lucrative markets to, uh, uh, I guess, focus your funding efforts in. All right, uh, so financing in emerging markets. Uh, again, I would like to uh, focus a little more on the emerging markets, considering the fact that most of the Black Sea countries do share in the fact that uh, they have a status of the emerging markets. So in the context of limited access to capital markets, which is also a pain that's shared by you know, a lot of the local, uh, local governments and countries, um, and heightened investment risks, uh, public bonds backed by credit worthiness of governments, uh, direct investment by foreign companies and bank loans, constitute the main channels of private finance for the SDGs in emerging markets. Uh, according to the World Bank data, uh, public bonds and foreign direct investment, the FDI, represented a large share of private capital for emerging markets at 5% and 3.6% of GDP respectively. Now, compared with private bonds at 0.8% uh, and equity portfolio investments at 0.2%. As you can probably realize, those are minuscule numbers, absolutely minuscule numbers, which have a lot of room.
Yes, hello everybody. Can you hear me? Professor yeah, Kibola? Hello? Yeah, hi there. I guess Professor Klimova has some network issues. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, allow me to introduce myself. I'm a head secretary of the Faculty of the Economic and Political Science here at the Aristoteles University of Thessaloniki. My name is Georgia Kotschia. I'm today's coordinator in this webinar um, teleconference meeting. Uh, Professor Klimova, are you finished? Professor Klimova? Can you hear me? Okay. So, um, is there any other question to Professor Klimova in order to uh, her presentation? No? Uh, I want to remind you that uh, our chat is now open and um, one here can uh, put this question in the live chat in order to answer from our speakers. I also uh, remind you the structure of the meeting uh, is that this it's a speaker uh, has at his her disposal uh, 60 minutes of uh, lecture, uh, 15 minutes for discussion and uh, 15 minutes we have break. Um, so uh, we are now at the 15 minutes break. And I see you again um, in 15 minutes after the break with the um, uh, next uh, speaker, uh, Chief Assistant Professor Ivan Bozikin. So we now have our break, okay? Yeah, thank you. You are very welcome. I see you again at 12 o'clock. Okay, thank you very much. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Hello? Professor Klimova. Yes, Professor Klimova. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what happened. It was probably kicked out. I, I, I don't know either. I don't know either. So uh, we have our breaks now. Uh, our mm -hmm. show. Uh, I see you again in 12 o'clock, punctual. Okay, sure, absolutely. Uh, do you, uh, is there something that I should do? Maybe send you a presentation no, or? We well, thank you very much for your presentation, Professor Klimova. All right, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.
Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Hello. Hello, yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can. Okay, so I want to remind you that the chat is open and we have a written question on chat already from Katerina Sidiropoulou uh, to everyone. Will the professor share with us the presentations after the webinar? Please answer this question to, to Ms. Katerina Sidiropoulou. Okay, so um, I immediately give the floor to the next uh, speaker, um, Mr. Ivan Bozikin, a chief assistant professor at the University of National and World Economy, Sofia, Bulgaria, to um, have the uh, lecture. Okay, I remind you, uh, Professor, that you have 60 minutes for your lecture, uh, 15 minutes for uh, questions, and 15 minutes for a uh, break. Okay. Thank okay. You. Okay. Thank you very much. I will try to share uh, my presentation screen with you. Uh, can you see my presentations? Yes, we can see. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, again, my name is uh, Dr. Ivan Bujikin, Chief Assistant uh, Professor at the University of National and World uh, Economy. Uh, just a second to so a chief assistant uh, from uh, university of national and world economy sofia bulgaria i'm also a member of um, editorial board of journal of cleaner productions um, this journal journal of cleaner production is a leading journal in the field of sustainable development the impact factor of the journal is uh, 7.2 uh, and many scientists uh, submit their uh, valuable research uh, to the journal first of all um, it's a great pleasure and honor to be part of this webinar uh, Many thanks to the organizers of the event. Uh, in the next one hour, I will focus entirely on sustainable development uh, and social entrepreneurship uh, as a critical tool for sustainability. Here on this slide, you can see the structure of my presentations. Um, I will start with presenting uh, a brief introduction to sustainable development. I will discuss the three dimensions of sustainable development, environmental, social, and economic. Um, I will also point out the main global uh, problems or challenges and how we can uh, solve them uh, by achieving sustainable development. Uh, here also give a difference between uh, weak sustainable definition and strong sustainable division, uh, definition. Then in point two, three and five, uh, I will elaborate on the three more, uh, most important uh, model, concept or tools for achieving uh, sustainable development, circle economy, agroforestry and social entrepreneurship. As a whole, the first part of uh, my presentations or the first 20 uh, minutes um, will be 20, 25 minutes will be dedicated to point one, two and three from the lectures. And um, the second part of the presentations, uh, the last uh, 40 minutes uh, will be dedicated entirely on social entrepreneurship as a valuable mechanisms tool for achieving sustainable uh, development. Um, I've also prepared two short video clips regarding agroforestry and social entrepreneurships. Uh, these movies or films will uh, give you additional information about these uh, very important uh, approaches. Um, as you know, after the, after the lecture, uh, we will have about 10-15 minutes uh, for discussions and comments related to uh, this uh, uh, topic. Let's now uh, start with the first point, introduction to sustainable development. Um, although the concept of sustainability has existed for many centuries, uh, it's become increasingly popular and important uh, over the last 30 years. The Brundtland Report, I'm, I'm sure that you hear about this report. So the Brundtland Report uh, gave the first definition for sustainable development. 
Uh, Brunton report defines sustainable development uh, as development that meet the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their uh, own needs. Furthermore, at the Earth Summit um, at 1992, the United Nations set sustainability as a global goal and proposed the equality of its uh, economic, ecological, and social pillars or dimensions. Here, social sustainability or pure refers mainly to poverty reduction. Economic sustainability or pure. Uh, um, excuse me, Professor uh, Bozekin, your slides is a little bit blurry. Uh, I don't know. It's not clear. Why? Your slides. Uh, the slides. Well, maybe some problems. Uh, it's a good. So the slide is okay. Uh, here. I don't know what is the problem. Okay. If you help me, we can solve this problem, but uh, the slide is okay here. Okay. I can see the, the text, everything. It's a little bit blurry, but it's okay. If, if, if you, please, please, please go on. All right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, sorry? It's okay. <clears throat> Uh, economic sustainability, uh, so economic uh, sustainability or pillars uh, refers uh, to uh, long-term sustainability of both, of both renewable and non-renewable uh, resources uh, so that they can fit in the production uh, systems uh, <clears throat> and uh, provide long-term benefits. And here, uh, environmental sustainability or pure refers mainly uh, to protections, uh, enhancement of life forms that exist uh, on the earth. According to Brundtland, uh, sustainability can only be assured uh, when it emphasizes the alleviation of poverty and deprivations, uh, conservation and enhancement of resources basis which one can assure that uh, elimination of poverty is uh, permanent, broadening the concept of development uh, so that um, uh, it's covered not only the economic growth, but also cultural and social uh, development. And finally, unification of economics and ecology in decision-making at, um, at all scales. Sustainable development has struck the focus of many uh, researchers, uh, scientists, uh, businesses, non-government uh, organizations, communities, international organizations in the last two decades. Moreover, uh, many uh, environment protection agencies has been set up or, or re-established in many countries around the world. They have the, the powers to examine the development projects and proposals of different dimensions uh, of sustainability before approving or disapproving them. Sustainable development has become a subject of uh, debate among environmentalists and uh, economists and broadly assessed in a weak and strong uh, term, weak and strong uh, definitions of sustainable uh, development. Uh, a weak uh, definition of sustainability is based on the economic value principles and neoclassical capital uh, theory. It uh, considers the capital value of natural resources, but completely forget uh, to take into account their uh, value in terms of the materials, natural materials and services it uh, provides. Whereas a strong sustainability uh, definition is based on biophysical principles and takes into account those certain uh, functions that the environment uh, performs for humans. For example, uh, a weak sustainability model or definitions uh, we will support the idea to estimate the economic value of uh, forest land only in terms of the total num uh, numbers of trees cut and the value it generates for uh, making, for example, furniture or paper. However, a strong sustainability model or definitions will estimate the financial contribution of uh, uh, 
uh, a forest, uh, not only in terms of the economic value of trees, but also its uh, environmental and social values. Because you know that trees in the forest provide food and shelter for many animals and humans uh, help in rainfalls, uh, provide fresh air, act as a carbon sinks, all of which are not taken uh, to any account um, in a weak sustainability model or uh, definitions. Thus, a weak sustainability model or definition um, is based on the philosophy that the main main capital is more important than natural capital. And natural capital can be substituted by main main capital. Uh, on the other hand, uh, a strong sustainability model or definitions um, uh, provide importance uh, to um, natural social capital in comparison to, uh, uh, to main main capital. Therefore, uh, a weak and strong stability model or definitions are different uh, from each other in terms of uh, philosophical and ethical perspectives. Maybe the government should focus more on the strong uh, sustainability model or definitions uh, uh, in the future. Here on this slide, uh, I hope that you can see the slides. Uh, so here on this slide, so I try to to shortly answer the, the following valuable questions. Why do we need sustainability? Or why is sustainable development essential? This is a, a very important questions. So first, the increase in the world populations that has occurred in the last decades uh, placed uh, increasing pressure on demands for society, and especially that of agriculture and industrial productions. Second, uh, the faster development of countries with large populations like China, India, and other countries from Asia has resulted in increased demands of agriculture productions and processes, which result in further increase in energy and water demands. Uh, As a result- Excuse me, Professor Bozikin, excuse yeah. me. We have many written uh, questions about the visibility of your slides. It's blue. Uh, we cannot see the slides. Can everyone read the slides? I cannot. I cannot read them too. Me either. Uh, is there any uh, possibility for updating your presentation, please? Uh, I don't know what to do in this situation because uh, everything is okay here uh, with my presentation. I can but see the text. Uh, everything is uh, fine. Um, so the problem is not here. Maybe the problem is occurred during the... <laughs> Uh, the network, it's, the internet. Um, I don't, I don't know. Maybe the the the, let, the font of the letters, the 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 colors. I don't know, um, because many many uh, question is about that. Okay, uh, I understand this. Yeah, I understand this. But uh, see your uh, slides. Well, I I don't know how to solve this problem. If you give me suggestions, uh, I have twenty five slides. Uh, and it's not possible to change all of them right now. Okay, so maybe if you could send them by email to Miss uh, uh, Kodia and uh, she could upload them because they're really blurry. I mean, uh, the previous person. Well, I've, I've already sent uh, presentations of uh, Professor Musov from University of National World Economy. Uh, so he has the presentation and can share with uh, you and uh, the participants. Or maybe you could upload it in the chat, in the group. Okay, we try. Now we try to do this. Okay, Professor Pozikin, you can proceed. Thank you. Okay, you can proceed, please. No, I will share first the presentations in the chat and then I'll mm. continue.
Okay, you can see the my presentation in the chat, but we'll take a few minutes to be there. Uh, okay, okay, I will continue. Uh, yes, of course. Thank you very much for your understanding. Okay. Thank you. Uh, As a result of sharp, incre uh, sharp increase in uh, the supply, sharply increase in cost, in many cases of uh, shortages of all forms of energy and water are happened and uh, have been happened. Uh, furthermore, uh, the resources for energy supply, like oil, coal, gas, uh, are limited. Um, clean water availability is limited as well. Therefore, sustainable development uh, is uh, needed uh, to manage the scarce resources uh, on the planet uh, efficiently and wisely. Uh, fortunately, we still waste a lot of the resources on the planet. Um, therefore, we need from new sustainable business models, approaches, concepts, uh, uh, technologies uh, to, be, to be employed. Uh, furthermore, many uh, researchers and international resolutions uh, highlight the importance of education uh, to achieve the sustainable development goals. The inclusion of a sustainable development curriculum uh, in educational curriculum was the need of the time. Besides uh, indicators um, um, for sustainable development, uh, help to provide reports and suggestions of policy makers uh, to, uh, to create uh, uh, policy and strategies uh, that would help regions towards sustainable uh, development. Uh, one of the most important approaches or models uh, for, um, for achieving sustainable developments are circular economy, agroforestry and social entrepreneurships. Now I'll continue with the first two approaches, a circle economy and uh, uh, agroforestry, and then I'll finish my lecture with uh, social entrepreneurship. So we move on to the point two from the presentations, circle economy. Mm. Circle economy has become uh, increasingly popular uh, in the last uh, uh, seven years. Circle economy aims to achieve a balance uh, between the three dimensions of sustainability, so economic, environmental, uh, and social. Previous research argues that the circle economy is a holistic approach that results um, and introduce the environment and social burdens by using conserving materials and resources. However, circle economy is um, identified as uh, economic uh, systems uh, based on different business models that operate on micro, meso and macro levels. Uh, here the micro levels refers mainly to companies, organizations, families. Meso levels refers to eco-industrial parks and uh, macro uh, level refers to cities, uh, regions, uh, nation and, uh, and beyond. The concept of circle economy requires transition from linear model of material management uh, to circle model of material management. Mm. The linear model of material management, uh, as you know, is based on the logic that after uh, production and uh, usage of products, they are disposed of on land field. Thus, the valuable material contains in them cannot be used again in the production process and in production of new uh, products. In the contrast, the circle uh, model of material management uh, is based uh, on the other logic. Uh, so circle economy consider waste uh, as resources uh, that can be used again in the production process. Building a circle economy uh, requires attention on the entire life cycle of the products from materials to, to the products. Therefore, it steps uh, from extraction of uh, materials and end of the life of the products is taken into account to build circle economy uh, in many countries around the world. The first steps uh, is uh, related to activities of extraction of materials and how these activities uh, can be improved, how we can uh, um, 
use, use it better and more eco-efficient. Uh, after that, the attention is paid to eco-design of the products and how this eco-design can be optimized. Uh, one of the ways to improve the eco design of the products is to use the usable uh, and recyclable material in the production process. Thus, the goods that are placed on the market after that will be more recyclable and uh, reusable. The next step after eco design of the products is uh, usage of products. Uh, recycling and reuse are the next important uh, steps uh, for building circle economy. Therefore, many legislations for recycling uh, and uh, reuse have been established uh, in a lot of countries worldwide. Uh, however, here should, uh, should emphasize that sustainable waste management remains the keystone uh, for applying the concept uh, of circle economy. Furthermore, the, uh, the standable waste management uh, uh, is an important one for building circle economy in European Union and for solving uh, environment problems, economic loses, and creating uh, new green jobs. Uh, therefore, fiscal and um, um, and uh, economics instrument is important to stimulate circle, uh, sustainable waste management in support of circle economy and uh, sustainable development. Uh, so that uh, was uh, short information about this model circle economy. If you decide you can uh, conduct additional research in this area and present your result in the, um, uh, in the school, uh, summer school next, uh, next summer. And now I'll move to point three from my presentation, agroforestry. Maybe you hear for agroforestry, maybe not. Uh, agroforestry uh, is one of the key issues in achieving sustainable development goals. Mm, the agroforestry is uh, land used management systems in which trees and uh, shrubs are growing among or around uh, crops or pasture land. This combination of um, let's say agriculture and forest has many uh, benefits uh, for society. Uh, for example, increasing biodiversity, reduce uh, erosions. It's also world food production, even cattle, uh, without devastating or harming the, uh, the forest. Uh, besides agroforestry, and agroforest systems can use entropic principles. Uh, it's a natural mechanism to combine different cultivars whose combinations uh, doesn't require pesticides, improve the quality of soil and produce uh, water. Oh, okay, uh, there are several important or key social actors that operate in agroforestry uh, systems. Uh, of course, on the top are agroforestry farms, but here I should also mention uh, agroforestry cooperatives, associations, municipal organizations, uh, training organizations, university research organizations, non government organizations, consumers, private companies, for example, logging companies, breeders, and beekeepers. Uh, here I should also point out uh, national and private nurseries and national and private foresters because they are also uh, important players in agroforestry uh, systems. So this, uh, these key social actors, most of these uh, social actors partner with each other uh, and therefore there are three types uh, of partnerships in agroforestry systems, uh, public-private partnerships, private-private partnerships and cooperations. Here, the public-private uh, partnerships um, uh, is uh, partnerships uh, between uh, public organizations, uh, public company or um, government or like municipality and private company. Private-private partnerships is the partnerships uh, between two or three uh, private uh, organizations. Uh, partnerships and cooperations can increase the eco-efficiency of uh, agroforestry systems. Furthermore, uh, partnerships can support agroforestry farmers and systems as well as, well as uh, contribute further to their development and complexity. However, however some important factors um, should be available 
to have a successful partnerships. And maybe you can see you know, these factors on the slides. So uh, first is desire for partnerships uh, on both sides. The, these are keystone factor is very important. This, then we have dissemination of knowledge and skill for combining carbon forestry systems and its benefits for pharma society. The next factor is sharing the risk between partners. It's not fair if only one partner in the partnerships take the whole risk uh, from the activities. Uh, so uh, therefore this factor is very important, sharing the risk between the partners. Uh, then we have a clear indication of <clears throat> responsibilities and obligation of each party in the partnerships. And the final three uh, important factors to have successful partnerships are compliance with national legislations, regular, regular payment, enterprise and uh, initiatives. Uh, there's not yet established specific law for, for agroforestry and agroforestry systems, uh, especially in Bulgaria, in Brazil and many uh, countries uh, uh, in Europe. I, I don't know how is the situation in Greece and Russia and if you have some information about uh, agroforestry and legislations related to agroforestry, you can share, share it with uh, us now or uh, when we have discussions. Um, however, in Bulgaria, we have several um, laws and uh, legislations that affected directly or indirectly agroforestry farmers. One of the challenges of uh, policy makers um, around uh, the world is to establish uh, a specific legal framework or legislations for agroforestry and agroforestry systems. These new legislations uh, could clarify what kind of agroforestry system could be established in farm regions and forest regions, because these two regions are different and different agroforestry system can be established uh, there. Uh, some regulatory mechanisms and financial incentives like subsidies, tax deductions to start up uh, agroforestry farms uh, could be considered these new uh, legislations. Furthermore, a register for agroforestry uh, farmers and uh, stamp for agroforestry products could be established. Thus, the agroforestry product will be more recognizable on the market by consumers. And agroforestry farmers will easily cooperate with each other uh, uh, because they can find a, a proper partner in this uh, new online uh, register. There are several challenges of working with uh, agroforestry systems. Um, for example, difficulties in distributions, difficulty in marketing positioning, lack of skilled labor, organizational challenges, frequent change in forest uh, regulations. Um, most of uh, Bulgarian agroforestry farmers also confirm uh, these uh, challenges. Uh, here I just want to mention that uh, we've conducted uh, case study research in Bulgaria and Brazil uh, uh, six months ago. Uh, so I work uh, and cooperate with two researchers from Brazil. Uh, we've interviewed uh, 24 agroforestry farmers from Bulgaria and Brazil and most of our uh, respondents uh, pointed out these uh, difficulties that exist uh, right now uh, on the market. Therefore, uh, young and future uh, agroforestry farmers uh, should aim for the following recommendations to avoid some of these uh, challenges or all of these uh, challenges. First, uh, they uh, should aware themselves about the existing legislations to know what is uh, forbidden and what is a law a to, to be do. In this area, they should uh, gain a specific knowledge on agroforestry and agroforestry systems. They can contact these young and future agroforestry farmers, uh, could conduct uh, let's say SWOT analysis of marketing research uh, before starting the, uh, their activity. Uh, it's very important to have long-term strategies because uh, you know that the trees are not growing for two or three months. You need years for this, maybe uh, one, two or three years depending from the trees. Uh, uh, also, it's very important to cooperate and discuss the situation with agroforestry experts and foresters. And finally, these uh, uh, young and future agroforestry farmers uh, that, want, uh, that want to 
to do such kind of activities should be inventive. Uh, sure, uh, he should know what, uh, what wants uh, to do, right? And now I've, uh, as I mentioned, uh, I've uh, prepared a short uh, video clip uh, related to Agroforest T. This film put together some of the most remarkable experience in syntropic agriculture and agroforest uh, in, in Brazil. Uh, so my suggestions is to watch this video and then we'll continue with the last point of my presentation, social entrepreneurship. I hope that you can see the video. from the lecture, social entrepreneurship. Uh, social entrepreneurship is uh, recognized as a key tool for overcoming social problems in society and supporting sustainable uh, development. While the concept of uh, social entrepreneurship is not a new phenomenon, uh, the field has increased significant growth over the past uh, 15 years. Social entrepreneurship uh, research is uh, diverse uh, some, uh, let's say, scientists uh, see social entrepreneurship as uh, processes that demonstrated uh, when government and non-government organizations operate uh, different, uh, different principles, uh, business principles, using, operating using different business principles. Um, Social uh, entrepreneurship is uh, identified as uh, valuable mechanisms uh, to achieve uh, uh, sustainable development goals, and especially those one uh, related to environmental uh, and uh, social aims. For example, goal one, no poverty, goal two, zero hunger, goal five, uh, uh, gender inequality, and so on and so on. Um, the variety of definitions associated with social entrepreneurship um, has exposed or recover uh, the lack of uh, unified definition in the in the literatures. 
However, the definitions provided by Marilyn Martin in 2006 uh, is widely used in the literatures uh, and, uh, and by scientists. You can see this definition. I hope that you can see this definition on the, on the slide. So Marilyn Martin uh, views social entrepreneurship as a process of creating mainly social value by combining resources uh, in new ways. Um, and when review uh, view as a process, social entrepreneurship involves the offering of services and products, but can also refer to the creation of new uh, organizations. Um, one of the most important uh, social actors in social entrepreneurships uh, are, of course, social entrepreneurs and social organizations. They are the engine of developing of uh, social entrepreneurships. Uh, social entrepreneurs uh, can create a positive uh, environmental and social uh, impact through their social organization and uh, value uh, chains. And here is a good uh, moment to give a definition for social organization or social enterprises because they are different from traditional for-profit organizations that also operate on the market. Uh, the definition that you can see on the slide is provided by the Forney in 2006 and also is uh, widely used by uh, scientists. Uh, social enterprises make, uh, mix different logics. They trade in the market, but not with the aim of maximizing the financial return on investment. For, uh, for their stakeholders, they receive public support to public policy, which they contribute to shaping. They are embedded in civil society through the development of voluntary collective actions around common goals characterized by public benefits uh, dimensions. Many of uh, scientific articles consider social entrepreneurships as a valuable tool to solve the main social problem of society. For example, poverty or poverty alleviation, supporting people with uh, disabilities, uh, in and uh, long-term unemployment, helping uh, vulnerable peoples in populations, uh, empowering women, gender inequality, uh, educational and health problems, and how these problems can be solved uh, through social entrepreneurships. However, poverty or poverty alleviation is the key social problem to which social entrepreneurship is seen as a suitable uh, cure. However, there is not many example in uh, scientific papers uh, that analyze, discuss how to solve environmental problems uh, by using social entrepreneurships. Therefore, it will be interesting uh, if uh, future research pay attention on social entrepreneurships as uh, valuable mechanisms uh, to find solution of environmental problems of society as well as how it can be used, I mean social entrepreneurships, how it can be used uh, uh, to solve the environmental and social problems simultaneously. Therefore, a future research in this area could be, could be conducted. Uh, now I will pay attention to the social entrepreneurship network and the role of different players. Uh, so social entrepreneurs cooperate with different players to improve uh, both the efficiency and sustainability of their social businesses and financial performance. The creation of workable social entrepreneurship network also addresses unmet social needs and creates significant social uh, changes. There are about um, 18 uh, key social actors uh, with whom social entrepreneurs and their organizations uh, cooperate, cooperate, partner with, as well as create their social entrepreneurship uh, ecosystems. You can see them on the feature one on the slides. Uh, so here is given the, the most important uh, key social actor uh, in social entrepreneurship uh, network. The relation between social entrepreneurs, social organizations, um, and uh, governments, municipalities, uh, customers, non-government organizations uh, are the most studied in the, in the literature. The relation between social entrepreneurs and social organizations, and let's say suppliers, associations, different associations, media, families, private enterprises, retailers, uh, recruitment agencies, uh, local communities, and community leaders is, le uh, is less studied in, in, in the 
social entrepreneurship literature. Therefore, the researchers, especially the young researchers, can conduct uh, uh, further studies um, in, this, uh, in this field. Uh, now I will give you some additional information about the most important social actors in social entrepreneurship network. First, I will start with um, educational organizations and university. So they play an important role in supporting social entrepreneurs and their social organizations. For example, university can create learning service uh, programs to engage graduate students in social organizations. The graduate student uh, can then develop a detailed SWOT analysis, uh, social impact statements, and uh, vision statements uh, for these uh, social organizations in order to support them in the management uh, uh, process. Non-government organizations could provide financial, technical, and educational support to social entrepreneurs. Mainly these directions can be the support of non-government organizations, Hospitals are also important player in social entrepreneurship uh, ecosystem or network. Uh, they, they can act as uh, social organizations and create innovative services to solve health and social uh, problem of society. And I'll give you an example here. Some hospitals and organizations in India provide low cost quality ophthalmology access uh, to rural uh, families and poor in, in India and, and their do doorsteps by using different uh, technologies like this one, uh, Zoom, and applying socially innovative uh, idea to scale up their uh, operations and to reach to, um, to more customers, to more uh, rural families um, and poor in India. They cooperate with many uh, other uh, hospitals, uh, non-government organizations, government and government authorities, uh, social innovators and media to scale their, uh, the success of their initiative. The next important player in uh, social entrepreneurship networks are social innovators. Uh, they contribute by creating new ideas, uh, social services, social innovations, business models to support social organizations, society, uh, and environment. Funding organizations financially support uh, social entrepreneurs and social enterprises through different uh, approaches like loans, uh, uh, capital fund, uh, crowdfunding, and so on and so on. It's very important uh, social entrepreneurship to, to be very careful uh, or very careful to any uh, intelligence uh, to manage uh, the financial resources provided by, by different funding, uh, funding organizations like banks, uh, business angels, private donors, in order to operate sustainability in, uh, uh, let's say, middle and uh, long term. To have a long term relationships and access to many funding or financial organizations, social entrepreneurs uh, should. Uh, establish a good relationships and trust among communities and financial institutions. This is very essential uh, for social entrepreneurs and their organizations. Uh, municipality, uh, local communities, uh, community leaders, country governments uh, also facilitate social entrepreneurs and their social organizations with the provisions of land, uh, facilities, financial support uh, or professional uh, skills. Municipality can share their valuable uh, resources or, or networks uh, with social entrepreneurs and easily connect them with the key social leaders and communities in particular uh, regions. Uh, social entrepreneurs um, mainly, uh, not mainly, but can more effectively uh, address social and environment problems in some cases by partnering with uh, municipality and other government authorities. Uh, social organizations um, strive to partner with governments and other government organizations, mainly to have access to public uh, resources. However, in this, uh, how to say, state uh, connection strategies, um, uh, social organizations become more dependent from the state. 
uh, therefore they cannot criticize very strongly the, uh, the government and push it to be more responsive to its citizens, uh, to be more effective, less incompetent and corrupt. Uh, these are reasons why some social entrepreneurs and social organizations avoid to partner with, uh, uh, with the state. However, the relationship between government and uh, uh, social entrepreneurs is bilateral. Uh, government can also support um, development of social entrepreneurships, even if some social organizations or social entrepreneurs um, avoid to partner uh, uh, or avoid to create the partnerships with state and other uh, government authorities. On this slide or point five, I will focus additionally um, on the relationships that, that exist between uh, government and social entrepreneurships. I will present you the, uh, the most important levels of government interventions and the key regulatory mechanisms used by government to stimulate uh, social entrepreneurs, social organization, and, and thus the development of social entrepreneurship. On table one, I hope that you can see table one. So on the table one are uh, presented the five levels of government interventions. Uh, on the top are the supranational level or supranational organizations. For example, European Union employ different uh, um, standards and uh, policies for social entrepreneurships uh, that uh, act as a guideline uh, for country governments. After the supranational level, we have country uh, government or national level. Then it's uh, regional level, regional government. It combines different municipalities from particular regions. And the final two levels of government interventions are municipal level or local government. And then we have organizational level or government organizations and government, and government agencies. Uh, here, I just want to mention that many uh, scientists, and scientists and researchers uh, uh, discuss or pay attention on the role of uh, country governments and municipality in social entrepreneurship uh, field. Um, however, uh, a few, only a few uh, social um, researchers or scientists um, discuss how um, discuss the role of uh, organizational uh, government organizations and government agencies uh, and how they can facilitate uh, social entrepreneurship. Uh, therefore, further research uh, could be conducted in these directions. For example, how can uh, separate uh, government authorities like university, hospitals, uh, schools, public transport better support uh, social entrepreneurs and their social organizations? The solution of these questions, of course, requires uh, further research by researchers. Uh, government used also different um, uh, regulatory mechanisms to promote social entrepreneurships. The most important uh, regulatory mechanisms are provided on table two on the slide. Um, so uh, the most used and uh, studied uh, regulatory mechanisms um, are, of course, subsidies, funding and grant, legislations, taxes, and public-private uh, partnerships. Other regulative mechanisms that are used by government to stimulate social entrepreneurships and uh, that are not uh, very well studied in the literatures are, of course, uh, um, vouchers and contracts, endorsement statements, website and media campaign guidelines, report labels, green uh, public procurement fees, and provision of in-kind resources like uh, land, equipment, and professional skills. As a whole, the role of government in social entrepreneurship's literature has been seen in the following directions. First, government uh, create a legal framework or standards so the social organizations can uh, function properly. Uh, thus, the social organizations can operate in a better environment and can be distinguished from traditional for-profit organizations that also operate uh, on this uh, market. Secondly, 
government provides financial support to social entrepreneurs and social organizations. The financial support is given mainly in the form of subsidies, funding and grants. The financial support, especially subsidies, uh, should be granted for period not exceeding, uh, let's say, three to five years. This is very important. Does the social organizations uh, who strive to improve their abilities, their leadership skills, the partnerships with other social uh, actors, uh, we do drawing on public resources when the government uh, aid has been exhausted, when the government aid has been ended. Uh, furthermore, uh, government can uh, provide uh, vouchers, uh, tax deductions, uh, provisions of in-kind uh, resources to further support the participation in social entrepreneurships. Thirdly, government create public-private partnerships with social entrepreneurs and social organizations. Once again, the social entrepreneurs can more effectively address uh, some environment and social problems uh, by partnering with uh, governments and government authorities and sharing uh, technical and financial uh, resources. Uh, the government can create and create also uh, endorsing statements, uh, websites, uh, media campaigns, uh, register for um, social entrepreneurs in order to facilitate the, in this field. Uh, education and training of uh, social entrepreneurs and their workers could be the leading priority of uh, governments. Uh, especially to public uh, universities and, uh, of course, the, the public uh, schools and uh, research organizations or educational organizations. And here on the last slide for my presentations, uh, you can see the different players, uh, the important players uh, in uh, social entrepreneurship uh, networks. Uh, the key uh, level of government interventions and uh, the most important regulating mechanism for stimulating social entrepreneurships is a complex uh, framework. So this com complex framework gives you the, the whole pictures how the government uh, uh, um, stimulate and affect the social entrepreneurship, how the government uh, support uh, mainly social entrepreneurs and social organizations and which are other key social actors that operate also in social entrepreneurship uh, field. And finally, to finish my presentations, uh, I prepared a second uh, video uh, that is related to social entrepreneurship. This video should give you the additional information on this uh, topic. So please watch uh, this video and then uh, we will have time for discussion. I wanted to find a solution to a problem and I wanted to do whatever it takes to end that problem. In the mid-1970s, Bangladesh was racked with poverty and famine. Greedy moneylenders victimized local villagers who wanted to start small businesses. In one village, Muhammad Yunus counted 42 people who needed just $27 to break out of poverty. So then I, an idea came to my mind. If I give this $27 to all these 42 people, they can return the money to the money lenders and they will be free. And that's what exactly I did. And the happiness that it brought to them caught me in. And I asked myself the question, if you can make so many people so happy with such a small amount of money, why shouldn't you do it more? Since that first bet, the bank Mohammed Yunus started has made nearly $5 billion in loans. It's a model that has been copied all over the world, spawning a movement known as microfinance. People are demonstrably better off in the world today by virtue of that simple insight that small, unsecured loans can really make a difference. Microfinance during the past 25 years has demonstrated that millions and millions of people can participate in society in a normal way. In 2006, Muhammad Yunus won the Nobel Peace Prize. 
testimony to the role of a new kind of change agent, the social entrepreneur. Social entrepreneurs, like Muhammad Yunus, see opportunities where other people see hopeless failures. They see potential where other people see tragic consequences. They see a future that others can't even begin to imagine. In this moment in history where government has, in, at least in some places, has failed to provide basic goods and services, the things that societies need to really allow individuals to thrive, social entrepreneurs are tackling those really big problems. Problems that reach beyond microfinance, such as educational opportunity, children's health, housing, clean water, climate change. And the problem is, if you look at what the current business organizations and governments are doing in this sort of space, it really doesn't add up to a coherent solution at the scale that we need. And therefore, I think entrepreneurs are going to be profoundly necessary because these are the people who sort of break up the concrete. Most people uh, have to see to believe. But I think that social entrepreneurs believe and then they see. Social entrepreneurs have seen that end result before it even got started. And they've done so all over the world. In Mozambique, Blaise Jujasato transformed healthcare by providing reliable medical services to millions of villagers who had never previously been reached. In India, Bunker Roy's Barefoot College teaches people with no prior training to build and install solar electric technologies. And in the United States, Dorothy Stoneman has shown how young people can change their lives and their communities through job training and education. We had 300 abandoned buildings in East Harlem where I lived. We had hundreds, maybe thousands, of young people standing on the corners with nothing to do and lots of homeless people. So I looked at that and said, there's something wrong with this picture. Someone should hire these young people to rebuild these buildings and create housing for the homeless people. And that's what we set out to do. What's the most powerful force you can bring to bear? It's a really big idea, but only if it's in the hands of a really good entrepreneur. It's that combination that changes the world. Today, thousands of social entrepreneurs are tackling a range of problems in all corners of the globe. But until recently, few of them saw themselves as part of a larger movement. Some 20 years ago, uh, social entrepreneurs were working alone. Fundamentally, they had no idea many times that other social entrepreneurs existed. They had a an experience of uh, essentially going against the stream, very hard. These are very tough people, but still alone. I think social entrepreneurs have always existed, but because they haven't always been defined as social entrepreneurs, because we've not always recognized them as such, they've had no collective identity. They have been lone pioneers. And now what you see in the world are a whole framework of supports that are coming up coalescing very, very quickly to say, hey, social entrepreneurship is really viable. Oxford recruits about 300 highly talented MBA students each year. Students want to know how to change the world. They want to know how the skills they learn in business school can help them change the world. You see social entrepreneurs and regardless of however many problems and challenges that they have, they don't give up. They just push forward and they push forward and that's inspiring to me. Today, Oxford is just one of many universities teaching social entrepreneurship and providing homes where practicing entrepreneurs can meet and learn from each other. The point of supporting the social entrepreneurship movement is to create a home for those people to make them less maverick and more of a movement. The more we wire the field together from local to national to global, it means that ideas go from Bangladesh to the US and Brazil, Poland to South Africa. That wasn't happening 10 years ago. Well, that's a function 
of the increased productivity of the field. I think the key thing that we have to come back to time and time again is these entrepreneurs cannot do this on their own. They need support. They need support from funders, clearly, but they need strategic partnerships with uh, mainstream business, and they need the support of government and policymakers. What's so exciting to be alive at this moment um, as a social entrepreneur connected to thousands of social entrepreneurs around the globe is that within all of us there's this growing movement and that, that there's a hopefulness in starting to look at the problems we have as our problems. My hope for the future is that by virtue of the stories that we tell about reasons for optimism, by virtue of the small pieces of success, we build some big pieces of success so that in a decade's time we can say this movement began with one very demonstrable success story and that was called microfinance but very quickly it built a series of other success stories and look at the effect they've had on the world. Okay, thank you very much for your attentions. Uh, I finished with my lectures and here you can see, uh, you can see uh, open questions. These open questions uh, can be a good basis to start the discussions. I hope that we have uh, 10 minutes for this. So this open question is, how could government policy in social entrepreneurship field be more effective? Because in the last slide, I've discussed different key social actors, the level of government interventions and uh, different uh, regulatory mechanisms that can be used by government. And uh, here is open questions. How could government policy in social entrepreneurship field be more effective, according to you? Uh, in my opinion, uh, it's an interesting idea about uh, proportion, proportional taxes, uh, okay. not only like a fixed percent, but uh, when just uh, proportional rising taxes uh, of the income. And uh, you, the same way, uh, declining taxes uh, depending on the lower incomes. Okay, and these regulative mechanisms can be used to support uh, only social entrepreneurs and social organizations, or we can think uh, about supporting uh, other key actors, because now nowadays uh, most of the government policies are concentrated are directed uh, mainly to social entrepreneurs and social organizations, but uh, but, but other uh, key players that are part uh, from social entrepreneurship network are not supported by government. And maybe here uh, we can think uh, in the future how we can support uh, these key social actors that also support uh, social entrepreneurs, social organizations, and that contribute to social entrepreneurship. Okay, thank you very much for your uh, answer to the question. Someone else? Well, I think uh, that to, to be more effective uh, government policy, uh, this policy should be oriented to the whole social entrepreneurship network and ecosystems. You know that there are about 18 key social actors that operate in this uh, social entrepreneurship network ecosystem. So government should direct their policies, their regulative mechanisms uh, to these key social actors. Uh, we should think how to stimulate, let's say, universities, uh, uh, different associations, non-government organizations, social innovators, uh, retailers, suppliers, to support further the social entrepreneurs and social organizations. And here, if a good example, but maybe you can use, the government can use, let's say, subsidies or tax deductions to support this, uh, uh, this player in the uh, social entrepreneurship eco ecosystems. Okay. Does anyone uh, want to ask something else to Professor Bozekin? 
Yes. From the audience, do we have a question? You can use only. Uh, uh, you can use uh, also the chat. We open the chat from your uh, computer to make reactions to written your uh, to write down the your questions. Is there anybody to ask something? <laughs> no. What kind of sustainable development policies could be um, implemented to the uh, further development of the Black Sea region? Yes, I think that sustainable development, the concept of sustainable development can be and is implemented in uh, Black Sea regions. Of course, the, especially the government and uh, other actors should do more to to develop this uh, uh, this approach further. Uh, maybe the government can use uh, more active the government policies in these directions to stimulate the other social actors uh, in different levels to, to work in this uh, in this road to improve the situation in the Black Sea region. Thanks for the answer. Thank you very much, Mr. Dimitrov. Anyone else who wants to ask something to Professor Buzikin? No? So I want to thank uh, Professor Buzikin for uh, his presentation with the title Social Entrepreneurship as a Critical Tool for Sustainable Development. And um, now we will start our uh, uh, break till uh, 1.30, okay? I will see you again in 1.30, okay? Thank you very much. Hello. 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 It's Mr. Kazimir Dimitrov. Kazimir,
Λίσσα από την Φόρου Σκρίνα από εδώ, πιο δεξιά, εκεί. Ναι. Έχει πάρει αυτή την εικόνα τώρα, το τελευταίο που μίλαγε. Τώρα πρέπει να τη λύσεις εσύ, μέσα από την εικόνα. Τώρα μου θα ακούμε να τη λύσεις. Μίλα. Ένα, δύο, τρία. Ένα, δύο, τρία. Δεν σε βγάζει κανένα, και πρέπει να σε βγάζει.
Hello again. Can you hear me? Welcome back to our webinar teleconference uh, in Thessaloniki at Aristotle's University. So uh, I immediately give the, the floor to the next speaker, to Professor Nicolas Theodosiu uh, in School of uh, Civil Engineering at Aristotle's University of Thessaloniki. Um, with the title SDGs in the Black Sea Region. Um, professor, you have the, the floor. Thank you, very much. Thank you all for being here. It's really a pleasure to have you all uh, with us. Uh, we would prefer, of course, to have you in person, but uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, we are uh, adapting to the, uh, to the conditions. Um, Uh, can you see my presentation? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I will say a few things about the uh, Sustainable Development Goals and especially uh, their implementation in the, in the Black Sea area, the area of interest of um, uh, our uh, webinar. Uh, I'm a professor at the Department of Civil Engineering of the Aristotle University of uh, Thessaloniki, and I'm also the chair of uh, SDSM Black Sea, and I will tell you a few, a few things uh, about that um, later on. Uh, we already heard a few things. We already know if, uh, a lot of things, but uh, we also heard a few things this morning uh, about the uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, they were adopted by the uh, United Nations uh, during the um, uh, Paris meeting in, two, in 2015, uh, along with the, um, uh, the, what we call the Paris Agreement, the Agenda 2030. And uh, this is the, the process, this is the goal that uh, all the nations of the world have decided to adopt uh, in order to, to provide a more sustainable uh, future for everyone. Uh, this is the, uh, how the declaration um, uh, starts of the uh, 2030 agenda. Uh, all the heads of states uh, and governments and uh, high representatives uh, met in um, uh, New York in um, September 2015, and uh, they decided to adopt this, um, uh, this path for um, uh, our common future. Uh, you know that uh, all uh, countries of the United Nations have um, uh, adopted and uh, they have signed this agreement. Um, unfortunately, the United States under the current uh, administration, they decided that uh, this is not for the um, best interest of the United States and they decided to uh, resign from the, um, uh, to withdraw their um, signature for the, uh, for the agreement. Uh, this. Uh, I'm sure you can understand the extent of this um, uh, problem, but um, we hope that in the future they will reconsider and uh, return to the path of the um, Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, you know that there are 17, um, the 17 uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, I'm sure you know this, um, this picture, you've all seen this, um, these colors. And uh, what, I, what I want to emphasize on this is that uh, the sustainable development goals are not just something about uh, the climate or the environment. Uh, they are everything, they cover everything, every, every aspect of life, every aspect of our future, from poverty and hunger, uh, to health, to education, uh, to uh, equality, gender equality and general inequalities, uh, natural resources, clean energy, uh, the cities, sustainable cities, the cities that we live in, uh, the environment, peace and justice, and uh, of course, climate change. What uh, we need to understand about this, uh, sustainable, this uh, 17 sustainable goals is that uh, they are identified as 17 goals, but they operate actually as one goal. They are future, 
which has 17 uh, directions. So uh, it's, a, it's a mistake to, to think that um, uh, one can focus on uh, one specific goal and uh, disregard or, or uh, not regard as highly um, uh, all the other goals. The goals must be treated as one because uh, if, if, we, if you try to, to proceed in one direction, in one goal, uh, disregarding the others, then you will go, you might cause the most significant problem that uh, the one you're trying to solve. Uh, this actually is, uh, was the reason uh, of the new approach that we have uh, since um, uh, last year, since uh, 2019, uh, about the sustainable development goals. Instead of um, uh, identifying these 17 sustainable development goals, the United Nations adopted a new approach, what we call the six transformations. Uh, so, in this slide, you see that uh, these six directions education, gender inequality, health, well being, and demography, energy decarbonization, sustainable industry, sustainable foods, land, water, and oceans sustainable cities and communities, and digital revolution for sustainable development. These are the new uh, groupings of um, uh, the sustainable development goals. So uh, as you can see in the um, yellow mark um, uh, under the each title, um, you can see that uh, all the sustainable goals are actually included in this uh, six transformation, and not just only once, more than once. Uh, this uh, demonstrates the complexity of the approach to Im implement the Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, we think that this is um, an even better approach than the um, uh, 17 uh, uh, goals because it uh, emphasizes the fact that um, we need to, to address this, uh, these goals as one or as groups and not just as uh, independent goals. This is something very important that I hope you all understand the difference between uh, each one of these 17 goals and the concept of uh, trying to, to achieve and implement uh, all the goals um, uh, at once or at least in um, uh, considering all the, all the sustainable development goals. Well, um, you know that uh, the sustainable development goals are um, demand a, a two-side approach, a top-down ap approach and a bottom-up approach. Uh, the top-down approach um, emphasizes or indicates the need uh, to, uh, to provide mainly the legislation, other uh, local legislation from uh, local communities or municipalities, or national uh, legislation or regional legislation like um, European legislation or even global uh, directions by the United Nations. Uh, we need this, um, this approach in order to be able to, to implement sometimes not very pleasant um, uh, demands because it's difficult to, to, to implement these uh, 17 goals and it's very difficult to, to try to implement it with this um, very uh, short time frame uh, of um, uh, we, we just have 10 years uh, for the um, implementation of the, of the sustainable development goals. So we need legislation, we need this top down approach in order to be able to have the tools actually uh, to convince people or to convince um, governments or uh, uh, business or uh, anyone else who is involved in um, uh, the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals uh, to actually uh, uh, focus on this uh, process and to uh, try to implement uh, this uh, Sustainable Development Goals. But in my opinion, the bottom-up approach is even much more important. The bottom-up approach is what we are doing right now. Uh, we are discussing this, uh, this issue, we are discussing it with each other, we are presenting, we are um, trying to make the difference. And um, it's never enough to have the uh, legislation you need if you don't convince people to implement the legislation. So what we're trying uh, to do is to convince people of the importance of the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals and get them involved in this process. If people are involved, 
then we have much uh, higher probabilities of uh, success than if we just use um, legislation or uh, uh, other top-down um, approaches. So it's very, very important to keep in mind that uh, we need this uh, bottom-up approach uh, in order to, to have a successful uh, implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals and to ensure our future. I remind you that the Sustainable Development Goals are for our future and not, is not just um, another test or another uh, try. We, we know that um, we tried, we've tried in the past uh, a lot of times to implement uh, such, a, such procedures. The Millennium Goals was the, the previous um, uh, procedure, but uh, they were not uh, completely successful. Uh, so the Sustainable Development Goals are something that we need to implement, we need to promote uh, in order to, to ensure uh, our common future. Now, uh, after identifying the problem, we need to identify also solutions because uh, it's very important to identify problems, but it's also very important to, to be able to provide solutions for these um, problems. And uh, I'm sure you are familiar with this um, saying that uh, uh, it's, we need to, to analyze the problem we need to spend time over the problem uh, because we need to be sure what we are trying to do. And then if we identify all the aspects and all the dimensions of the problem, then the solutions are, uh, they, they come for, the, from the, for themselves. Uh, when the United Nations decided to adopt this agenda, the Agenda 2030, and, to, um, and they identified these um, 17 um, uh, goals, they actually identified or proposed um, a road for this uh, for the implementation and for the solutions. This uh, road is identified as the Sustainable Development Solutions Networks. Uh, these networks, as you can see here, they mobilize scientific and technological expertise uh, to promote practical problem solving for sustainable development. And uh, th this is the concept of these uh, Sustainable Development Goals. They operate under the auspices of the United, of the Secretary General of the United Nations, and the uh, global leader of this um, process is uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs from the uh, University of Columbia. Uh, so, these um, networks actually uh, call for um, uh, the participation of um, universities and research centers because. Uh, they understand, the United Nations understood that um, with, the, with the tools that we already have, it's very difficult to, to result anywhere else than um, the, uh, the point that we are right now, because we, we have tested these tools and they were not completely successful. So we need new tools, we need new ideas, we need new proposals. And these new ideas and new proposals most probably will come from universities, research centers. They will come from you and me. They will come from the, the, the fresh minds, the students. They will come from the professors. They will come from researchers. Because we need something else. We need something more than what we have right now. So the United Nations promote this idea of uh, trying to find solutions for the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals through these uh, networks, the Sustainable Development Solutions Networks, the SDSNs. Uh, it's, uh, these networks are, um, uh, I will show you a map later on. Um, they cover, they almost cover the whole planet. And uh, it's, uh, it's free for anyone to, to join. Uh, more than um, thousand uh, institutions are already members of this um, uh, movement. It's free, of course, there's no charge. Anyone can um, participate. And um, uh, I would like to emphasize on that, that uh, uh, apart from this um, SDSN networks that I will talk to you about um, later on, uh, there is an, another parallel type of network, which are, which are called SDSN youth networks. And these are, I'm sure that they will be of interest of um, 
our students who will participate in this uh, uh, webinar today. So uh, these are parallel networks, the SDSM youth networks, and uh, they are operated by students. They have, uh, again, a global coordination. Uh, but uh, the concept is that, um, as, as we said, we need this bottom-up approach. And this bottom-up approach at this level will come from students. So we need the participation of students because they are young and they are fresh and they have ideas and they have uh, uh, the ability and the courage and uh, uh, all that it takes uh, to move forward this in this um, uh, direction. So uh, look for these uh, networks and um, become part of them because it's really, really important uh, that um, everyone participates in this um, uh, common global uh, goal. This is a map that shows these, uh, the networks that uh, operate right now. It's more than, it has there are more than a thousand members in um, the, all uh, the continents. And uh, this is a, uh, a map of um, the existing uh, networks. Uh, there are two types of networks, national networks or regional networks. National networks are concern separate countries. So there is um, SDSN Greece, there is um, SDSN uh, Turkey, SDSN France, SDSN Russia. Uh, a lot of countries have their own SDSN networks. But there are also regional networks that cover specific areas. There is SDSN Mediterranean, for, uh, for example, and there is also SDSN Black Sea, our own uh, network. Uh, this uh, network expands in uh, 12 countries from the Balkans uh, all around the Black Sea up to uh, Azerbaijan in the, in the Caspian. It's one of the largest networks, uh, as you can see from the, uh, the map. It uh, comprises um, 12 countries, Greece, Albania, Bulgaria, Romania, uh, Serbia, Moldova, Russia, Ukraine, Armenia, uh, Georgia, Turkey, and Azerbaijan. Uh, this network has been, has been launched in um, October 2018, so it's operating for um, a year and a half or something more. Uh, the host institution is um, our own uh, university, the Aristotle University of um, uh, Thessaloniki, and I personally have the honor of being the chair of this um, network. Professor Zarudiadis and uh, others uh, are members of the Leadership Council that uh, operates this um, uh, large um, network. You can all participate, of course, in this network. You can, you are most than, more than welcome uh, to join us in this um, effort to bring together uh, all these um, uh, 12 countries in the direction of the, the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. Professor Zarudiadis will tell you about the new development we had um, a couple of months ago and uh, in the direction of the implementation of the SDGs in this um, uh, area, but uh, you will see uh, something more about that later on. You can find us in this uh, website uh, or email us or join us in, um, in Facebook uh, and uh, get information or ask for more information or uh, anything that um, uh, you want to know of on how to join or how to participate in our um, efforts in this um, area. Now, uh, we, we know that uh, we need to implement the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. So in order to be able to identify where we stand right now and what we need to do in the, uh, in the coming years uh, to try to achieve, we, we know that we will not be able to achieve uh, all over the world the sustainable development goals by 2030, but we we want to know where we stand and uh, where we are in a good position and where we are in bad position so that we need to uh, strengthen our, our forces uh, for the implementation of uh, specific SDGs in each um, country. Uh, for that, there is a process that um, it's a global process that is coordinated by the United Nations uh, that actually tries to identify 
what uh, the, the ranking of uh, each country of the world in this process of the implementation of the SDGs. Um, each year, there's a report that uh, is uh, issued. You can find it in this, um, this web website. You can download it for free. Uh, both th this report and all the previous reports, along with a lot of um, other interesting uh, information about the implementation of the, uh, of the sustainable development goals. And I will show you some, some of the outcomes of this um, uh, uh, report. This, uh, the current report, the 2020 report, was um, presented less than a month ago. So it's something very uh, new and fresh. Uh, this is a table, a dashboard, uh, showing the, um, uh, the current position of the OECD uh, countries. Uh, I'm not sure if you can read the countries, but uh, it doesn't matter. Um, uh, I will, um, you will have the presentation um, distributed later on. Uh, you can understand from the colors that uh, green is good, red is bad. Uh, this is usually the case, but with no political um, uh, projections, just uh, the colors. But uh, let me draw your attention on these uh, three columns. Uh, you can see a lot of reds in these uh, columns all over the country, all over the, the countries of the OECD. These are the uh, developed countries of the, of the world. And you can see that uh, in goals 12, 13, and 14, there are a lot of reds all over the world in um, responsible consumption and production, goal 12, climate action, goal 13, and life below water, goal, goal 14, which is actually one of the most significant goals uh, for, the, um, uh, for our network and for our region, uh, the Black Sea, uh, due to the existence of the sea, of course. So you can understand that there are a lot of things that need to be done, and not only in uh, developing countries, but also in uh, developed countries uh, as well, maybe even more in these um, uh, countries. Uh, this is, these are the rankings of the uh, 12 countries of our networks. I just went through the, uh, the report and identified the, uh, the position, the score uh, of each one of the countries of, the, uh, of our network. Uh, the first country is outside our network is uh, Sweden with a score of um, 84.72. The last country in the world in the rankings is uh, Central African Republic with just um, 38.54. And you can see in between uh, the 12 countries that I mentioned earlier, the countries of our um, uh, network. Uh, first of all is um, Serbia, then Romania, Bulgaria, Moldova, Greece, Ukraine, Azerbaijan, Russia, Georgia, Albania, Turkey, and Armenia. Uh, depending on, uh, on, the, on their score, in the, in the implementation of the, uh, of the SDGs, the current implementation of the SDGs. Uh, there is a huge question mark in this uh, ranking and this uh, scoring uh, because uh, it's very, very difficult to, to draw the data from uh, all these uh, countries of the world and uh, to, um, to identify through this uh, data what is actually going on in these um, countries. So this picture, I, I think that the first and the last, uh, Sweden and probably the Central African Republic or some other country, probably they, they, they are scoring is, um, uh, it's what it should be. But um, in, 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 in between countries, uh, I'm not completely convinced that um, this is the exact um, uh, situation. Because it's, uh, as I said, it's difficult to draw the data and it's difficult to identify them and it's difficult to, to rank them. Uh, one of the, of the goals of this uh, project that um, Professor Zarudiadis will uh, speak about um, later on is to try to, uh, to provide something more in this direction, the direction of, um, of ranking and identifying uh, where each country stands in this process of the, uh, the implementation of the SDGs. Uh, this is another figure, one of the many figures, one of the many tables. Uh, it refers to the, um, sorry. 
uh, it refers to the countries of um, Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Most of the countries of our network, except from, for Greece and Turkey, if I'm not mistaken, all the other countries are uh, categorized in this uh, area, Eastern Europe and Central Asia. And I've uh, pointed out with these uh, arrows um, the country. So in each row, you can see the, um, uh, the color that uh, um, represents the process or the status that uh, each country has achieved for each one of the uh, 17 uh, SDGs. You can see greens and reds and uh, uh, yellow. Um, there are a lot of um, marks and also you can see some, uh, some arrows that um, uh, actually demonstrate uh, whether there is an up, there is a, um, uh, some, um, a movement in, on track that goes up or uh, a decreasing process. Uh, uh, process or uh, uh, a stabilized uh, procedure or anything else. <coughs> uh, this is just uh, the, the outputs of the reports. There is, uh, you can understand that there's a huge amount of information uh, behind all these uh, uh, numbers or um, figures, and you can find many of this information, much of the information in the um, uh, the report that I showed you uh, earlier. This is uh, these are the um, uh, the signs that uh, demonstrate uh, the process uh, for the implementation of um, uh, the SDGs for each um, for each country. <coughs> and um, just to to uh, to finish, I I selected to to present you uh, some something some more analytic uh, results on the three countries that participate today in this um, uh, webinar, Bulgaria, Roman uh, Russia, and um, uh, Greece. Uh, you can see that um, Bulgaria has an, an overall score of uh, 74.8. Uh, the ranking is uh, 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 number 39 in the, uh, the world, which is um, very good. And also you can see the colors that demonstrate uh, their achievements in each one of the, of the goals. It is identified that uh, uh, the um, uh, worst uh, um, goal for Bulgaria is uh, to reduce inequalities. I'm not taking any position here. I told you that I have my reservations on, this, uh, uh, on the accuracy of these um, results, but these are the official results as published by the United Nations. And as such, uh, they are presented. Um, this is, uh, these are the results for um, Greece. Uh, the red ones are uh, quality education. I'm really not sure why. Uh, it's a responsible consumption and production and um, climate action. Uh, the overall score is uh, 74.3, and uh, it is ranked in um, number uh, 43 in the world. And this is uh, Russia. Uh, it's uh, further below the other two countries in um, uh, 57 position, with an overall score of 71.9. Uh, uh, and uh, the weaknesses are emphasized on uh, good health and well-being, <coughs> uh, goal number three, in um, inequalities, goal number 10, and um, peace, justice, and uh, strong institutions as goal uh, 16. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot to discuss on, this, um, uh, on these rankings and uh, these uh, 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 pictures that you, you see right now. Um, there's a lot of uh, dispute and a lot of um, uh, discussions uh, about the accuracy of these um, goals. Uh, I don't believe, and I don't think that many people believe that uh, uh, this uh, ranking is, uh, very, is very accurate, but it is something, and we need to base our estimations on something tangible in order to be able to focus 
uh, on, um, on our weaknesses and to emphasize on that and try to, uh, to move forward in the implementation of the, of the SDGs. It doesn't really matter if um, uh, the uh, one goal is uh, yellow or uh, orange or um, uh, uh, green or red um, in, this, uh, in this report, because we, we know and we understand that there are a lot of weaknesses in uh, collecting this, uh, the data that uh, this report uh, needs. But it, it is an indication, not an exact result, but an indication. And we need to focus on these um, indications and we need to take uh, the opportunity of this um, report in order to, to coordinate uh, as, as in, the, in the best way we can uh, the process for the implementation of the SDGs. And uh, the reason I is... I interrupt you. Can I ask uh, just one question? I'm finishing. This is my last uh, slide. Oh, all right, all right. Uh, the, the problem is that if we are trying to find a plan B, there's no plan B. I mean, there was, there was a plan B in uh, previous approaches, even uh, during the Millennium Goals, but uh, we all understand that we are in a position right now uh, where um, there is no plan B. And uh, we need to, to try to implement this, um, uh, these goals because uh, time is running out and uh, we don't have any alternatives. So uh, this is what I, I wanted to, uh, to talk to you about. I'm not sure if we, if we are having uh, the questions now or after the presentation of uh, Professor No, no, excuse me, Professor Zaudosiadis. Yes. I, I have to announce that if there are any, any questions, they will be asked at the end of the second presentation. Okay. After the presentation of Associate Professor uh, Mr. Zaudosiadis as a whole. So, okay, so uh, can you, you please ahead? hold your question and um, I have more time to discuss it after, um, after the next presentation. Yes, of course, of course. Okay, thank you. So I return the uh, microphone and uh, give the floor to Professor Zaudosiadis. Thank you. Uh, okay, we well, thank you very much, Professor Zaudosiadis. And um, I immediately give the floor to Associate Professor uh, Mr. Zaudosiadis, Dean of the Economic and political science of the Aristotle's University of Thessaloniki. Professor, you have the, the, the floor. Uh, thank you. Thank you for, uh, thank you for uh, giving me also the opportunity to contribute to this, uh, as we said in the beginning of today, uh, greetings, very important event. Um, it is uh, a pleasure for uh, Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, uh, I'm sure also for the Financial University under the support of the Russian government and the University of National and World Economy to host this event. Uh, I'm sure that you are quite tired and that you have already some questions with respect to the content of uh, uh, the presentation of uh, uh, Professor Theodosiu, and thereby also not to forget uh, to mention the very important contribution and the fact that it exists or, or also that uh, of, of, the, of the SDSN Black Sea, which will be uh, an important uh, network that would also, will also support the realization of uh, uh, our um, uh, actual summer school uh, that will follow next summer. Um, I, I will try to be quite brief with respect to my contribution um, as uh, presented already and described by Nikos. Uh, we thought that we, it would be nice in the frame of, uh, of this uh, first one day webinar to contribute uh, uh, to uh, just give me a moment.
so uh, it, it was important from our side to uh, contribute by describing the situation of SDGs of Sustainable Development Goals in the area. And, and following the contribution of Nikos, I thought that I could perhaps try to uh, orient you towards the uh, um, the aspect of SDGs, which is related to the uh, to the sea, given that we are discussing about Black Sea, and thereby this links us uh, to the very important issue of the blue economy uh, or blue growth, uh, a very uh, contemporarily significant term, uh, both in terms of economic significance, but also in terms of uh, social and environmental sustainability significance. So allow me to go now through the uh, um, presentation that I prepared also by sharing uh, this in your screen. Just give me a moment. Right. So I hope that you can see now the presentation. Okay. I suppose that the silence means that there is no problem. So let me first move with some introductory notes um, what is the the term blue economy and how this is related to the sustainable development goals and to the sustainable development overall um, a, a, an introductory approach uh, something that has been discussed over the whole day um, uh, when we are speaking about sustainability we have to have in our minds two different aspects some of the analysts mentioned three, social, economic, and environmental. I prefer to mention two, the socioeconomic, as social and economic issues as are highly interrelated and hardly can be distinguished on the one hand. On the other, the social and economic aspects are the aspects of the human-related or created environment, while the environmental issues are those who are related with the natural environment, uh, both of them need to be sustained in the most efficient way. Uh, why do we need to discuss about that? Why is there a, a discussion about sustainability? Why is there a need of having a strategy for sustainability as it is the one that pre was presented before in the frame of the United Nations strategy previously with the Millennium Goals and nowadays with the Sustainable Development Goals? The, or why is there a need to have uh, national or regional policies uh, planned and applied? This is simply because market cannot solve all the issues. Or if you ask me, market can solve or can answer very specific questions and issues. And surely the fact of having market failures in that sense, the fact that we have increasing returns to scales, which leads to olig oligopolies, or the fact that we have inhomogeneities, which is a source of monopolization, or the fact that we have imperfect information and externalities, externalities in any different sense, macro or microeconomic, uh, positive or negative, and so on. Um, so all these things speaks for the for for the conclusion that market alone cannot solve. Um, many, if not the biggest majority of the issues that are open for the society and the economy. And therefore, we need to intervene. So there is a need to intervene in order to succeed in having sustainability. At least this is what uh, actual happenings have, have proven, uh, given the uh, severe problems in terms of socioeconomic and environmental sustainability that we have to face as humanity. Um, now, moving, moving forward, blue economy is, a, as I said, a relatively new term. Uh, on the one hand, it relates to the whole issue of socioeconomic sustainability because uh, the, 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 uh, the recognition that uh, seas 
oceans and water related activities uh, are affecting or can affect in a positive way socioeconomic issues and the issue of economic growth uh, is uh, is something which is very important for today's uh, economies uh, specifically in the in the frame of blue economy what we understand is tourism transportation fisheries any type of coastal activities uh, r and d uh, so research and development with respect uh, to uh, issues, questions, production of new innovator, in, innovatory products and services, all of them related to the sea and oceans, uh, and also energy issues. So issues that have to do with um, the production of uh, energy or the efficient transportation of energy uh, through uh, and on the basis of, of the water existence. Uh, so, uh, but this is this is the economic aspect of blue economy. So, in other in other uh, words, it is uh, a, a listing of the different sectors uh, that can uh, uh, provide uh, uh, GDP uh, uh, production that can provide income production uh, in order to sustain to strengthen. Uh, the GDP growth perspectives, uh, not only of the countries that have a direct access to oceans or seas, but for, the, for all the economies. Nevertheless, the term blue economy is not limited in the fact that oceans and seas can produce or can be used in order to produce um, uh, income, uh, economic income. Uh, it, is, it is also another aspect of the term blue economy which is very important and we should not forget uh, it is the fact that blue economy means production of income by uh, the utilization of uh, water but at the same time production of income in a sustainable way uh, in a socially and environmentally sustainable way and thereby there are many interesting questions with respect to the content of uh, the term blue economy. I will give you only an example. You have here in my, in my slide, for instance, um, the uh, listing of uh, sectors of blue economy as this has been understood in the frame of the European Union integrated maritime policy. And if you read uh, the note here, you would see that for them, blue growth communication highlights the large potential, economic potential related to aquaculture, biotechnologies, marine and coastal tourism, marine renewable energy, and, and a very important um, uh, sector for them, deep sea mining. Now, here is, for instance, one of the examples that re results out, one of the questions, but I said that results from the fact that Blue economy is not simply the production of, of income, but it is the production of income in, env in an environmental and social sustainable way. And therefore, the inclusion of deep sea mining, especially when we are dealing, because this is majorly what people mean by that, especially when we are dealing with mining of um, uh, hydrocarbons in order to have new sources of that type of energy, uh, it is here a big question mark in as how much this can be part of blue economy or blue growth, given that uh, this sector does not necessarily contribute uh, in the environmentally and socially sustainable way of, of, of development. So having all these discussions in our mind, what I am uh, and, and question marks. What I'm going, what I'm trying, what I will try to do in the next minutes is to give you an overview of the discussion in the frame of the European Union, mainly, but not only. Also, the collaborating, the directly collaborating countries of the Black Sea. So I will give you an overview of what has been discussed with respect to blue economy in the Black Sea at that level of politically deciding Grimia. Okay. Now, uh, what we will have, in other words, is uh, a, uh, a short uh, uh, guide over uh, the four plus one uh, 
uh, important uh, conferences that have been uh, have been organized mainly, but not only, uh, through the EC Maritime Affairs Directive. Uh, so uh, the first one was in January 2014 in Bucharest, uh, and the title of this first EC Maritime Affairs Conference was Sustainable Development of the Blue Economy of the Black Sea. So a more general approach, yet uh, with a specific uh, orientation enhancing marine and maritime cooperation. As we will see in the following slides as well, marine and maritime cooperation is one of, is perhaps along with specific types of tourism, uh, uh, is the major sector of what we understand under the term blue economy that is, has been recognized by the EC by the Commission and by the participating collaborating countries as the sector for blue economy in, in the uh, uh, Black Sea. Typically because uh, the importance of the Black Sea as a, a trade connecting uh, node uh, and therefore the importance of marine maritime cooperation and connection is, is uh, high uh, and especially significant, not only in our times, but also from the historical periods uh, of human history in the, in the, in, in the region. So, uh, yet, as we will see uh, in the concluding remarks, um, it is an important sector. On the other hand, by not recognizing the importance of the other sectors of the economy as well, might be a problematic issue. Let's go over the sessions that have been discussed in January 2014. As you will see, you see also here the, the, oh, the strict orientation in marine, my, maritime issues. Um, uh, partnerships in the region to foster maritime cooperation was the, was the first session. Blue growth, blue growth, sorry, and especially the integrated maritime policy of the EC. The second session promoting cooperation on fisheries management as well as sustainable seafood production and consumption. Here we have the uh, reference to specific sector, which is also very important in the region because of overfishing activities uh, over the last decades and decades. Preserving the marine environment of the Black Sea, the port, and fostering the Black Sea economy through cross-border projects and maritime clusters. Uh, just a short mentioning of the uh, closing, concluding remarks of the first conference in 2014, uh, that there is a need for well-organized and efficient cooperation around the Black Sea. You will see later on that this needs remains also today. Uh, that cooperation in the region will fully reach its potential impact only with full commitment of all countries, from all countries around the Black Sea. Keep it also in your minds because I think that there is a lacking contribution uh, uh, with, with uh, the, the fault line in both, in both uh, uh, parts, if you ask me. Uh, there is a, a problem in, 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 in with respect to the uh, cooperation in the region, and we have to discuss about this. And the third one is that future actions should be built, should be built in small steps and in full consideration of what already exists and is being done. This is a very important concluding, closing, concluding, concluding remark because truly there are many, there were many previously, there were many different initiatives focusing on the same issue, blue time, uh, blue growth in, in uh, the Black Sea, but uh, uh, functioning parallel with uh, uh, parallel uh, activities uh, and initiatives. The second Maritime of First Conference uh, was in 2015 in Sofia, and the title was Smart and Blue, New Opportunities for the Blue Economy of the Black Sea. Here, the orientation was uh, uh, in, in two directions, as we can see from uh, the three sessions. Firstly, the orientation was in the direction of uh, connecting and enabling business initiatives that would have a contribution to the blue growth, to the blue economy of the Black Sea. Therefore, the first and the third uh, session is in this direction. The first under the title Connecting Businesses uh, 
uh, we have uh, here again uh, the maritime transport in, in two ways. On the one hand, as, as a sector where business initiatives of multi-country, multi multi-state business initiatives could be realized. On, and, this, and from the second point of view, because sustaining an efficient maritime support could help in having uh, business connectivity in other sectors as well. Uh, the third session with respect to the creation of business opportunities, here also uh, some uh, discussion about legislation and governance um, uh, and about the inclusion of maritime stakeholders and entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs in, in the whole discussion. Uh, the second session was for a very specific uh, area of uh, tourism with respect to blue economy, fishing for tourists, uh, uh, where fishing communities could provide source of income through activities like pesca tourism and showcasing the Russian, the natural and cultural heritage of the areas. Um, let me go a bit faster over the other three uh, uh, annual initiatives. The third conference in uh, June 2016 uh, in Odessa, where uh, again here we have uh, three sessions, the cost to cost uh, connectivity, speaking again for maritime tourism and maritime economies. Uh, the fostering, the, the second session with a focus on the fostering on maritime research and innovation cooperation in the, in the Black Sea. Um, here is the first time that we see the sector of R&D coming into the, into the play, nevertheless with a specific uh, orientation again in innovation activities for marine and maritime uh, um, issues. And, and the last contribution, the last session, a general session speaking about investing in blue growth, uh, where uh, here there was a discussion very similar to the one that uh, has been uh, presented to you previously in the beginning of the webinar uh, with the first contribution of Gale. Um, and then in the fourth conference in Batumi, September 2017, where, where uh, this is why the first session is with RED, we have actually uh, the uh, repetition of the third session in the, in the, third, in the third conference. If you see, it is exactly the same content, a discussion about um, uh, increasing investments and thereby the competitiveness of blue economy in the area. Um, in this fourth com conference is the first time where the discussion goes also in other sectors and where the discussion starts getting also a stronger environmental orientation next to the economic orientation of the previous conferences, speaking of blue sea, sorry, blue economy in the Black Sea. For instance, in the second session where we have the Save the Sea uh, initiative and discussion, or the third se section where we don't simply speak about the efficiency of fishery, but speak especially about the necessity of having a strategy and a, a, a common understanding uh, and collaboration among the uh, different uh, uh, countries and fishing communities in the Black Sea for the threats of uh, exploitation of, of an over-exploitation of marine living resources, for the threat of uh, the sustainable development of aquaculture, and also the threat of uh, uh, marine environment and vulnerable species. Uh, very, uh, very high and significant threats, especially, unfortunately, in the Black Sea. Uh, and then again, uh, we went into uh, the repetition again, coming, coming back and back uh, in each annual conference, the discussion about maritime infrastructures uh, and the better environmental monitoring in the Black Sea. This is the last session where given this, session, it gives me the opportunity to, to, to 
present you or to inform you about an, a, a very important uh, a project that will be realized in the next months by Aristotle University of Thessaloniki and the Financial University uh, under the support of the Russian government. A project that is dealing with the creation of an SDG monitoring observatory for the Black Sea. Uh, a, a project which uh, will also give to many of you the possibility, hopefully in the future, either to work in a vocational or in a research-based way and to support uh, the monitoring of SDGs and the, and the, and the improvement in, in, in terms of SDGs in the Black Sea. Uh, and then we have the final um, Maritime Affairs event. After having uh, four uh, subsequent annual conferences, uh, as we have uh, presented, the one in Bucharest, the other in uh, Sofia, the third in Odessa and the fourth in Batumi. Uh, we, uh, the European Commission and the Maritime Affairs Directory moved into a fifth event, which was not a, uh, in 2018. It was not uh, a conference in a typical way. It was mostly um, an event of political significance. Uh, 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 the, the title of it was European Maritime Day, and it was again in uh, uh, Bulgaria realized and hosted in Burgas, majorly but not only, where Black Sea ministers, ministers expressed their support for a closer regional cooperation of maritime affairs, including transport, environment, research and innovation. And they endorsed also the Burgas declaration towards the common maritime agenda for the Black Sea. Uh, nevertheless, here, uh, what we see is that uh, what I said in the beginning, uh, speaking of the necessity of having a multilateral uh, strong collaboration in the area, there is, for the moment, a higher degree of collaboration and inclusion of Black Sea countries, uh, majorly in the western, southern, and part of the eastern part. So there is there is a lack of uh, uh, political and also economic and also R and D collaboration in terms of including the northern part as well. Therefore, uh, speaking of that, I'm very happy that our three universities, the university uh, from Russia, the financial university uh, under the support of the Russian government, the university, the economic university in Sofia, UNVE and, and us, uh, we contribute in this direction, uh, given that we uh, put three major institutions from the area that I mentioned before in, uh, in a trajectory of continuous uh, collaboration in terms of sustainable development. Uh, uh, those, this, this was a short uh, overview that, that I wanted to give you with respect to what is going on uh, with blue economy discussion, blue growth discussion for the Black Sea. Uh, as you, uh, I, I could summarize it saying that uh, there is an increasing significance given to this issue. Uh, from the side of the European Commission, but also from the side of the countries uh, of the Black Sea region, which do not necessarily participate directly or indirectly uh, in the European Commission. So there is an increasing significance given to this issue from all the major partners and, and players in the region. Uh, if, if we could uh, try, if we should try to find some weak points in this uh, development till now, then those would be the fact that we have on the one hand uh, an, or an orientation majorly in the economic aspect and less in the environmental one. It was starting to be the case in 2017 more and more. So therefore I believe that the contribution of our discussions and our collaboration in terms of sustainable development, especially in an environmental way, will be very important for the blue economy of the area, of the Black Sea. And another perhaps uh, uh, 
weakness or things that need to be things that need to be improved is the fact that uh, we should have a stronger um, inclusion in in our discussions of all the different uh, uh, seasides of of the Black Sea. Now, uh, a, a final a final point, and perhaps um, thereby. And a, a motivation for the discussion that will follow is the fact that uh, um, actually the discussion about blue economy, the discussion about sustainability, the discussion about the future of the Black Sea region, uh, once again, it is not the first time in human history, once again, it is, uh, uh, it is a way of bringing forward a, a, a wider discussion, uh, a discussion about the Eurasian future. The Black Sea was always, always, along with the Eastern Mediterranean and the other seas of the region, was always uh, a major point uh, where uh, the future of Eurasian uh, um, uh, the Eurasian infrastructure was was to be decided. And I think that this is also the case in our days and in the future. Uh, and, and actually what we need to answer is in as how much we see Eurasian meeting in this area from the Black City to the, till the Eastern Mediterranean as becoming a belt of antagonisms and even of casualties. Allow me to remind you of, a, of an unpleasant reality, the fact that uh, uh, around 60% uh, of worldwide casualties uh, in terms of human lives due to political and military incidents are to be found in our days in this belt from starting from the Baltic Sea uh, down to the Black Sea and to the Eastern Mediterranean. Or if we can go towards the alternative of a belt of progressive collaboration. And, and uh, we do have these possibilities. We do have these abilities also given the historical background of collaboration and coexistence in that area, but also given the future that lies before us. Um, just, just as a short contribution to the discussion, what we could think of, uh, it, it is also in the, Nikos will understand me uh, perhaps, but it is also in the sense of similar initiatives about the three or four or many other seas collaboration in that area. Uh, a plan for seas of cooperation and sustainability where the following issues could be addressed. The blue economic perspective, not only in terms of economic perspective, but also in terms of sustainability. I'm insisting on this. The social and environmental sustainability in that sense. Peace, security and safety. Not any of these three parts can go alone, only together. Freedom and respect also have to be together. Preservation of diversity and enhancement of communication. One of the major uh, uh, strong points and characteristics of the area is the existence of diversity, of a deeper line and in, in, in developed diversity, which needs to be preserved but at the same time to enhance communication of the diverse identities, quality over quantity, and the issue of decommercialization. For the last three points, I did not have the time to explain what I mean. I hope that we will have the opportunity to do that in person uh, next year in the frame of the summer school uh, that will be hosted here and where I hope that I would be able along with my colleagues, with Nikos and uh, my other colleagues, Georgia and Elias, to host you and welcome you next summer in August. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, me and Nikos, we are open for your questions. Uh, okay, Professor uh, Zolotiadvis, we thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, this is where the guest speeches end. And um, if there are any questions, please, you can take the floor. Uh, anyone from, from the audience? Also, our chat is open to put your question there.
I think Mr. Khan. Yes, I had a question for the previous presentation for Professor Nicholas. Uh, it was about the tables which you were showing us, uh, which were correlating to the status of uh, well-being in different countries. Uh, you've mentioned several times that uh, it is quite difficult to collect the data for these tables and uh, I was just interested um, in which way was the data collected for those ones uh, which you show, showed already, how was it collected? Well, um, as I mentioned, it's a very, very difficult task and, and it is a, con a controversial task. Uh, up to now, but it's something that needs to be done in order to have an idea of where we stand. So this state, there's this, a specific process uh, that was identified by the United Nations uh, who uh, organized uh, this, um, uh, this, uh, this effort. Um, there is a specific process, uh, col they collect data from uh, the statistical organizations from each country. Uh, they collect data from um, some specific organizations that are recognized by the United Nations for their credibility. Uh, and uh, some data are provided by the countries themselves. So uh, even from that, you can, you can understand that um, uh, there is no common way of identifying this um, data from uh, uh, for each country. So some countries are very uh, organized like Sweden, for example, they have been doing this for many, many years, even before uh, the uh, implementation of the of the SDGs. Something that uh, it was uh, interesting uh, for the country. Uh, so they have the infrastructure and they have the the um, the methods of collecting and providing and uh, evaluating this data because it's not just to to collect and to send someone the data, uh, data need to be processed and need to be evaluated. Uh, there are other countries uh, for, who, for, um, for several reasons, either they are not that organized or they, they, they don't want to provide this data because you understand that uh, some, um, some questions are very delicate. For example, uh, uh, equalities or inequalities. Um, uh, yes, of course. Or uh, justice. Uh, you understand that these are very delicate issues. Uh, so, uh, the, the, there is a multi-approach process from the statistical organizations, uh, other different some countries' organizations who collect uh, uh, data, and from um, uh, data that uh, the countries um, present for, the, for themselves. And um, uh, if you, um, uh, if you. Um, so um, uh, a remark by uh, Professor Zorodiadis uh, that we are starting now this um, uh, a feasibility study for the need to install an observatory for the for the SDGs for the process of the SDGs in the wider area of the of the Black Sea. This is we we hope that this will be another source of um, uh, of data for a much more accurate uh, approach of this um, uh, analysis. All right, thank you. This seems pretty logical. Thanks a lot, once again. Thank you. Okay, is there any other question, please, from the audience? Okay, then. So, uh, I want to thank you all for your participation here today. So the first one day will be a program uh, for the uh, summer school, sustainable development in the Black Sea region, uh, all the participants. So I want to inform you that um, all, uh, uh, all the, the presentation uh, are already recorded. Uh, if uh, there, is, there is any uh, question for Professor Zarotiadis, he will be answered in due time. Um, so, um, if there is no other uh, thing, uh, I think it's time to, to close this meeting.
Okay. We well, thank you all of you once again. Thank you for all the presentations and the, and for the event itself. It was really interesting. Okay. We well, thank you very thank much. You. For your thank you. Thank you. Thank you, okay. everyone. Bye bye. Have a nice have a summer. summer. Thank you. Have a thank good you. summer, good vacation. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. It was uh, very nice to see you and to hear so interesting uh, topics. And hope to see you in reality next year. Yes. We okay, hope we'll have the opportunity Thank next you. year to meet in person. I mean, it, it's very important. It's very important, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. You're welcome. You. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. All the best. All the best. You too.